All right, Jennifer's back. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Wednesday, August 2nd, 2017 meeting of the Edina City Council. Uh, roll call, please. Ms. Tim. Member Brendel. Here. Member Fisher. Here. Member Staunton. Here. Member Stewart. Here. Mayor Hovland. Uh, here. We have a uh, form of meeting agenda in front of us this evening. Is there anyone who wishes to modify the agenda? Just one change that I see at the top of the agenda. It says Tuesday, July 18th. Needs to say Wednesday, August 2nd. If that change can be made, please. Thank you. Thank you. With that change on the date, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? We've got a motion and a second to adopt, adopt the agenda for August 2nd, 2017. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Carried. Uh, before we go into community comment, um, I want to talk a little bit about item. It is 6A, which is the uh, proposal for Arden Park. I'll tell you what happened. Uh, yesterday, Manager Neal and I had a uh, cup of coffee with uh, Steve Timmer, who's sitting in the second row, one of the neighbors uh, in uh, around 54th Street Bridge. We started this process uh, so long ago, I thought we'd, uh, somewhere along the line we'd had a public hearing. And it turns out uh, when Scott called the uh, city, we hadn't had a public hearing on this matter. And it, it made me think a little bit about the situation we had uh, it was last winter with respect to the uh, proposed winter park improvements, uh, winter improvements at Braemar uh, Park. And that was an issue that uh, caused people uh, to have some pretty strong feelings on both sides of the issue. And we thought, well, normally where we might take a park enhancement project and just handle it at the council level, coming through the park board with the various consultants, uh, in the case of those proposed winter park improvements uh, or winter improvements at the park, we said, uh, let's have a public hearing and get that input from, the, from both sides on the issue. And it was really productive, I think, to, to get that information firsthand for all of the decision makers up here. And uh, I think we made a more well-reasoned decision because of it. So uh, when we discovered yesterday that we'd never had a public hearing on this matter, uh, where people in our town could have uh, a direct voice with the decision makers up here on the dais, uh, the thought was that we should propose this to the council this evening and, and discuss that. Uh, here, here's my general notion, I think. Uh, well, let me just tell you what I was thinking about, and that is, that tonight the uh, Minnesota, uh, Minnehaha Creek Watershed District folks are prepared to go forward and make their presentation. We'd have them make their presentation this evening, so everybody has that information. It's out there uh, uh, recorded. It's on our local public access channel. People can access it over the next few weeks. We would set a public hearing for the first meeting in September, which is also a Wednesday. Uh, and then we would take public testimony at that point in time. Tonight we would use this period of time for getting the presentation for council to ask questions uh, that may be pertinent to the uh, overall project. Make no decision tonight, of course, because we'd have a public hearing the first uh, uh, meeting in September. And then the council will take the matter up uh, the second, at least this is our notion, the council would take it up the second meeting in September uh, and then make a decision on what they want to do relative to the proposed uh, restoration project in the Arden Park neighborhood. So uh, that's kind of the sequence of things. And, and the council, of course, we haven't had a chance to discuss this idea. And I'm going to turn to my council members now and, and discuss this, vet this through so we can decide how we want to deal with this issue. And that may affect whether some of you want to stay for the presentations or, or watch it on TV later, but we can resolve this issue now. And Member Staunton, I, I know that uh, you've got some thoughts on this issue? I, I think it's a terrific idea. I'd, I'd, um, I'd endorse approaching it that way. I think, you know, there's one of the things we've learned is we've all read a lot of emails and talked to a lot of people is there's a lot of different dimensions to this project. And so getting some information tonight, having a chance to ask some questions, get some answers and, and, um, and digest that as we go forward and then having an opportunity for folks um, who care about this to get up and 
and share their perspectives in person. Lots of people have availed themselves of the opportunity to do that in writing. I can, uh, I can testify to that fact. Um, but it'll be good for people to have a chance to do that in person as well. And then I think it's a good idea, again, for us not to try to make a decision right after we've heard from the public, but instead try to digest that and all the information we've had here and, and uh, try to aim for that second meeting in September. The other thing I think that's valuable about um, having this session tonight is we may discover some things in the conversation and in the question and answer that perhaps there's some follow-up information we can get that would be helpful to be provided at that first meeting in September in conjunction with that public hearing. So I, I'm in favor of that approach, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Member Fisher? i just go down the line. Yeah, I, I, I'm also very much in favor. I, I feel like I have more questions than, you know, every bit of information. And there's been a lot of information coming our way. And um, a lot of these emails, there's some nugget of something different that we haven't read or haven't thought about, both sides. Um, and as we're, I, I look forward to tonight to be able to ask more questions. And, um, and I think the idea of having a public hearing but not having to make a decision that night so we can sort of digest it all is really important. So I'm all in. Good. All right. Member Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, too, uh, I, I, well, I was surprised that we hadn't yet had a public hearing, so I'm glad uh, to have the opportunity to have an, a public hearing. I think it's a good idea. I would like to ask the folks from the Watershed District, with your permission, um, whether or not the timing is something that is um, mission critical for you or if, it, if it, the decision waiting until mid-September works. Ms. Clark. The schedule um, that is proposed and has been discussed of uh, construction beginning late 18 into 19 um, does still seem feasible um, given that uh, scheduling shift that you're talking about without you know, further review. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so you favor this notion of what Indeed, we're discussing yes. here. Thank Manager Neal. After I'll oh, wait yeah. until after Councilman Brindle. Member Brindle. Uh, that's fine with me. Um, I, uh, the, yeah, our inboxes are busily collecting emails. Um, if you've already sent an email, I would ask that let that email stand and uh, we have it, we can refer to it. Um, and if you haven't sent us an email, you're welcome to do so. But, um, but uh, I, I have no problem with having a public hearing. Okay, good. Thank you, Member Brindle. All right. Um, Your Honor. Yeah, Manager Neal. Just in, in terms of kind of summarizing uh, what I, where I think the council is on this and where I, uh, we've had some discussion with um, Watershed District staff about how we might want to uh, organize this from here on out is we'll su we suggest that we'll, we'll continue going forward with the full team, full presentation tonight, including uh, the scientific uh, consulting staff that the Watershed District has brought with them. Uh, overview, it's, so we'll answer questions from council and do that presentation. Uh, at the public hearing itself, uh, we, we would not have the, the scientific consultants from the Watershed District. We'd give a, a, a much more truncated, concise kind of reminder presentation to council about about what we did tonight and what this process has yielded, uh, and then leave most of that time and attention for the night for the public hearing itself on the 6th. And I'll, I'll remind that's a Wednesday, uh, uh, the first Wednesday in September. And finally then, the 19th, which is the third Tuesday in September, uh, we would have, we, we would propose no presentation actually for the council at night. That's your time to, to talk uh, among each other uh, to make a decision about how to go forward. So right. that's, I think that's that would a, be the process I'd yeah, suggest. I think the end of that is a good clarifying uh, statement that the uh, public hearing would be held the first uh, meeting in September, which is the first Wednesday. Uh, that public hearing would then be closed. So the second meeting in September would be council discussion only, not right. another public hearing. No additional public hearing at that right. time. Okay. So, uh, Manager Neal, would you uh, prefer that we have a motion uh, to set a public hearing on the concept plan for Arden Park for the first Wednesday in September? I, I would, and, and the, putting it out to the first September, for that first meeting in September provides us 
uh, enough of a time frame where we can adequately notify uh, folks who are interested in the subject matter and make sure they have time to prepare their comments for you. So yes, that would be good. So that looks like uh, Wednesday, September 6th. Is there a motion so on moved. that? So we got a motion, we have a second. second. We got a motion and a second to uh, hold a public hearing on the concept plan for the uh, for Arden Park uh, on September 6, 2017. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Carried. And do you need another motion with respect to setting the matter over for the uh, second meeting in, in September for council discussion? I don't think so. Okay. Very good. Now, uh, having dealt with that issue, uh, we'll go to community comment. And I think folks in the audience have heard this that have been here before and, or heard it this evening that uh, if you come forward for community comment, it's on something other than we've, something we have on the agenda this evening. So we're not going to take any comment on the proposed uh, Arden Park uh, project this evening. But if, you have, if there's anyone in the audience that has another issue they want to address with the council, please feel free to come forward and uh, give us your name and address and, and tell us what you're concerned about. Good evening, Mayor, Council, staff. My name is Jim Stromberg. I live at 3930 West 49th Street. Um, my only purpose in coming to the podium tonight is just to say a thank you to you, Mr. Mayor, staff members, police department, and everyone else that was involved in all of the work that went into making last night that neighborhood night out night a success. I know you had somewhere in the 90 to 100 different neighborhoods that were celebrating their neighborhood. I'm just speaking for mine. Um, we had a great time. This is the first time we've been able to be out in the street and it uh, was evident in the turnout that we had from all of the people. We have a lot of renters in our neighborhood, young kids that are renting and uh, they came out to meet who lives across the street or down the street from them. It was just a really great night and I want to thank everybody that's involved in putting that all together from your side of the bench here. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Tromberg. It was a pleasure coming over to your neighborhood last night. Good evening. Good evening. Mayor, council members, staff. Uh, my name is Mark Cook. I live at 6609 Nordic Drive. Uh, I'm here tonight to discuss the uh, conditional use permit that was granted to the school district for the high school and middle school project. So when the uh, Edina Planning Commission had their meeting on February 10th in 2016, I attended that meeting and I had three concerns for them. It was the protective landscaping along the west side of the property as the, the roads has been enhanced and the parking lots been changed on that side of the building. Uh, concerns about lighting and light pollution from new lighting that would go up for that, for the road and the parking lot and the building. And finally drainage what would be the impact on, on my property and my neighbor's property, which sits at the bottom of the hill uh, below the parking lot and the road. So the, the, uh, the planning commission heard my concerns, the conditional use permit granted by the city, by you, to the school district includes conditions regarding lighting and uh, landscaping requirement. Uh, I've requested several times from the school district some assistance on this issue and that there's nothing has been done with respect to that requirement. Uh, no response, no information, um, and it, as well as with respect to the lighting. Um, the lighting appears to be higher and brighter than any of the existing lighting at the other parking lot. They placed the stanchions and the thir and 30 foot high lighting um, uh, stands uh, on the residential side of the road. On the other parking lot, the lights are on the parking lot side of the road. There's numerous lights, there's more going up. They run all the way down the road. The road was moved closer to the residences and they tower above the properties that are at the bottom of the hill. Um, and they're LED lights and they can be turned up and down and they've done some adjustments to them for us and have turned them off in the night a few times, but they're putting up a lot more and they have made no indication that they have any intention to move the lights or do anything with, the, with, that, with that lighting and it's impacting the entire neighborhood. Um, Finally, with respect to the drainage, um, I had the same issue in 2004 uh, when they first installed that road. Uh, we had water coming down that hill that hadn't been coming down that hill before. The engineering, engineers in the project indicated that they'd had it, had it under control. I had to do extensive work 
on my property. I asked about it, same comment from the engineers. We've got it all in hand. We've had additional water coming down the, the Mr. side Cook, of the Mr. Cook, I hate to interrupt you, but your three minutes are up, but if okay. you can tell us what you'd like to accomplish, I, I or if you have it in writing, we can yep. take it. Uh, absolutely, I, I want to request that you consider revoking the conditional use permit, uh, because the conditions are, are not in substantial compliance, and I understand that the city council can do that when there's not uh, substantial compliance with the conditional use permit, until the, until the school district complies with the permit. All so right. give them whatever the process is. I know there is a process for doing that. So I'm requesting that you consider that. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Cook. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. My name is Anjali Khanna, and I live in 6605 Nordic Drive, Edina, neighbor of Mark Cook. And I'm also having some issues with the construction that is going on in the school. So this year, in June, we had a massive rain, and in my backyard, where there was like a natural rainfall, waterfall coming in my, I couldn't figure out, and went and connected with the construction company across. Then it took them a couple of weeks, more than a week, four weeks or so, to connect with me. Last week, we connected. They, rev they came and saw my yard. Every time the rain comes, the water keeps coming towards my house, and I am concerned about it. The construction company has reviewed it with the engineering team, and they say the engineering work is sound at the school site, but in the journey while getting there, I am the <laughs> I'm getting all my landscaping and backyard is receiving all the work and drainage issue over there. So I would like that to be addressed. Construction company is taking measures that they are putting at their end of the hill, but on my side, there is nothing that need, has been addressed. My ask is that it should be looked at my property too. I've lived in the community for over 25 years, have never had any drainage problem or any problem living in this beautiful city of Edina. That's all my ask is. Okay, good. Would you give me your address again, please? 6605 Nordic Drive. Nordic, okay. Well, thank you for coming in this evening. Thank you all for right. hearing me. We'll refer this to staff and yeah. thank you, sir. get them to work with the school district. Yes, yes. thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hi. My name is Mary Ann Martinek, and I live at 4425 Brookside Terrace. I've been a citizen of Edina for 65 years. And my concern is, I came in kind of by Arden Park, but my own concern is I live at, on the creek just south of 44th Street. Mm -hmm. And that needs some dredging or something, because the people who try to canoe through there they get, have to get out and pull their canoes through. Last night there was a family and they were pulling their canoe and they were, the water was just up to their ankles. So it's really, you know, if the watershed or the community wants to do something, I look at that and I'm okay, but I don't canoe, you know. And there's wildlife there. It's, it's amazing. I think when the Highway 100 went in, a lot of that sludge or whatever came off into the creek. Now, I lived on 55th and Kellogg and used the Arden Park for my children. And then I lived on 67th and Tracy, and now I'm on Brookside Terrace. And when I look at that, people said, ooh, it looks like a swamp out there. So, you know, if anybody's concerned about the creek and keeping it nice, I would like somebody to take a look at that. So is that obstacle behind the condominium project, or where is it exactly? It's that? Um, east, let's see, it's west of 100 and east of Brookside Avenue. So it's just a one little dead-end street, actually. Sure. Okay. And North Avenue is on the other side of the creek. So, you know, people are trying to swim out there and bring their canoes, and they can't move. Okay. And it's got all that green stuff all over it, too. So it's been that way for a long time, so... I thought, as long as I'm here, I might as well address it. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Ms. Martinak, thank you. Hello. 
Good evening. Um, I already provided my address, if that's all right, uh, in writing, if that's all right, that I not speak out loud. Uh, so your that, address? Yeah. Yes. How about your name, please? For confidentiality. Uh, Louise Weaver, and uh, I'm a resident of Udina. Uh, I sent an email to all the council members. Um, um, my name's Louise Lit Weaver. Um, first of all, thank you for the recent action. Uh, limiting the sale of tobacco products to adults. This is a very wise and welcome step toward protecting our children. Now I'd like to, the city council to consider my request for designating secondhand smoke a, a health nuisance. I live in a smoke-free apartment community, but some smokers continue to smoke in their units when management is not on site. Um, the secondhand smoke enters my unit at, at all hours and is affecting my health. Um, management is not able to do anything to stop this when they're not, uh, when they cannot witness the behavior. Um, I read in the book How to Be uh, the Smartest Renter on Your Block, written by our own home line, a tenants' rights group, that secondhand smoke is the same as a noise disturbance legally, and as a last resort, the police can be called. However, I checked this out with the Udina Police Department and was told that they would not respond to this kind of call. I was referred to the city health department, um, and I spoke with Jeff Brown, um, who said that this would have to be researched and written into city code through a request by the city council. I think that this is very possible, since secondhand smoke is already classified as a class one carcinogen, which is the most carcinogenic substance there is. Um, the wording is already present in the city code with only specific language for secondhand smoke yet to be included. If this is addressed the same as a noise disturbance, then the police officers would be able to provide the kind of motivation that is needed to stop smokers from being able to pollute the air in a community living setting uh, and particularly a smoke-free community. Um, Today, I uh, also contacted Paula Keller, who is the director of cessation at Clearway, Minnesota, with the quit plan. And she told me that the FTA has deemed nicotine replacement therapy while smoking to be safe. And that's in the form of gum, lozenges, and patches. So that is an option. Uh, smokers do have an option. Um, in a smoke-free setting or in, in any community living setting. So they are not forced to smoke if they have an urge. Uh, they have options. So this would be a, a, a tool in the <laughs> toolbox of options for people dealing with secondhand smoke. And I also would like that to include uh, vape from e-cigarettes. Right. Good. Well, thank you. Ms. Weaver, I think what we'll do is refer that to the Community Health Commission and have them take a look at it and give us some advice on it. So, right. But I appreciate you bringing the uh, you issue much. forward. Interesting. Very interesting. Anyone else for community comment? Okay. And we'll move on to the next portion of the agenda, which is the consent agenda. We've got uh, seven items on the consent agenda. Is there anyone on the council that wishes to remove an item from the consent agenda? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the consent agenda in its entirety. So moved. Is there a second? Second. And a motion and second to adopt the consent agenda in its entirety. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Carried. Uh, and now we are on to reports and recommendations portion of the agenda. And the first matter there under 6A is uh, the matter that we talked about at the beginning of the meeting, and that is the uh, proposed concept plan for Arden Park. And Director Catry is going to lead this matter off, and, and then we will have uh, presentations by the Watershed District and questions by Council. Thank you, Mayor Hovland, members of the council. 
Uh, first thing I would like to do this evening is introduce some members of the team that I have here with, with me this evening. First of all, I would like to introduce Renee Clark from the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District. I also have Jonathan Kusa from Interfluv. I have Jessica Wilson from our engineering department and Ross Bittner from our engineering department. And I have James Whisker here also from the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District. Just a brief outline of uh, what we intend to go over with you this evening. Uh, I'm going to be discussing a brief project history and the context of this plan to the Parks, Recreation, and Trail Strategic Plan. Uh, we will talk about the basis for the Minnehaha Creek Corridor improvements. We'll go over the concept plan, development, and review. And we'll talk about some project benefits and then the funding schedule. So just a, brief, uh, just a brief history of how we started to talk about the Arden Park plan. Uh, the city and the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District have a history of collaboration on a variety of different projects through permitting, regulation, projects that we have completed together at Pamela Park, and street reconstruction planning and cost share initiatives. In 2014, the city and the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District decided to create a more formal framework for collaboration and we created a memorandum of understanding to talk about areas of planning, park planning, stormwater, and natural resources management. Then during the 54th Street Bridge Project, the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District began coordinating with the city to explore potential opportunities to improve the creek. At that time, the Watershed District had Interfluv complete an analysis of alternatives to identify options to improve fish, fish passage. And they identified three different ways to uh, improve fish passage underneath the 54th Street Bridge. It included uh, grade control, a rough and channel, or a bypass channel. At that time, the Watershed District attended public meetings to test a variety of alternatives and discovered that there was a high recreational value with kayaking in that area. So at the time, because of the recreational amenity, the Watershed District recommended the low flow bypass to the Watershed District Board to allow fish passage while still preserving the uh, kayak surf wave. At that time, the Watershed District did have concerns about the value of adding a fish passage when they realized that there were areas of the stream that were degraded, and they did at the time ask Interfluv to look at opportunities to improve the overall habitat in that area. The Minnehaha Watershed District Board did order a project, and the fish bypass was designed into the bridge plans. And at that time, the city's bid project was delayed due to high, uh, high bids for the project. And then the flood of 2014 eliminating, uh, eliminated the kayakers' standing wave. After that, the watershed district engaged the kayaking group and received a letter of support um, eventually for the removal of the dam. Then in 2016, the watershed district and the city began formal planning process um, of how to integrate the watershed district's natural resource goals along with some of the city um, of Edina identified goals. As we look at uh, different park planning projects, the first thing that we always do is look to our recently completed parks, recreation, and trail strategic plan to see how it fits into the, uh, the overall recommendations, goals, and strategies that were identified in that plan. And as we looked through, uh, we identified many areas that were highlighted in the strategic plan, and I'll go through just a, a few of those quickly with you this evening. Some of the recommendations from the park assessments were to provide greater access in parks for passive recreation and interpretation, to protect and improve Edina's water resources, to provide more environmental education opportunities, to replace insufficient play areas and playgrounds, and provide new facilities to fill gaps, to improve branding and wayfinding in our parks, to provide additional community gathering spaces, to develop community-driven master plans for our parks, and to replace or decommission community park buildings that have outlived their lifespan, specifically referring to our park shelter buildings. And in terms of the strategic plan goals, we talked about protecting, enhancing, and restoring the city's natural resources and natural areas, 
We talked about creating more resilient and sustainable parks, facilities, and landscapes, protecting and restoring Edina's water resources, and increasing facility access and consistency throughout the city. And then in terms of strategies, we talked about increasing connections and access to natural areas and environmental resources, coordinating with the engineering department to meet changing regulations and integrate those regulations into park master planning projects. We talked about partnering with the engineering department to identify opportunities to increase water quality throughout the city and identify opportunities to treat city stormwater on park property to benefit both projects to provide more active and passive recreation opportunities and educational efforts focused on water resources, to create a plan for replacement of outdated facilities, including the Arden Park Shelter Building, and also replacing old and inadequate playground equipment. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Renee Clark. Thank you, Richard. Mayor, members of the council, um, I'm going to start with the watershed district's strategic objective in managing um, natural resources throughout Minnehaha Creek Watershed District. Um, the watershed district covers parts of Carver and Hennepin County and is 181 square miles. It includes iconic resources such as Lake Minnetonka, Minnehaha Creek, and the Chain of Lakes. The district um, works in a focused way to manage um, water resources um, throughout this 181 square miles um, in, uh, with strategies um, in the western part of the district to improve Lake Minnetonka, focusing in the Six Mile Creek area um, where there's um, about 14 lakes, many of them are impaired, um, in the Painter Creek drainage area. Um, also a developing uh, more rural area, both those areas draining into two of the most polluted bays on Lake Minnetonka. In Minnehaha Creek, which is 41 or 47 square miles, um, that goes through five cities, um, and then, you know, like I said, through the chain of lakes to the Mississippi River, we have um, a regional strategy there, um, which looks at the issues of water quality, um, you know, poor stormwater um, runoff from urban development, water quantity, flooding issues in the creek, um, flashy flows from rain events, base flow, um, and then ecological integrity, the corridor fragmentation that we've seen as a result of urban development. Our strategies throughout this 47 square mile geography that drains to Minnehaha Creek are then treating regional stormwater, restoring the creek channel, and expanding and enhancing green space. All our work is done through um, public and private partnerships, integrating these goals and strategies with the goals of our communities to achieve these water and natural resource benefits, along with community benefits, many of those unidentified um, in your strategic plan for parks. Within the Minnehaha Creek Corridor, over the last 10 years, we focused in an area in Hopkins and St. Louis Park. Um, this area is shown, um, you'll see Highway uh, 7 across the top of this map. This is a 1930s photo, and you'll see Meadowbrook Lake um, at the bottom of the photo. Um, the district has, through the science and data that we have, um, we know that this area received the, receives the most pollution um, per any area along Minnehaha Creek, and that was the purpose of our specific geographic focus along this area. Looking at um, what happened and why that is, um, here's a photo, uh, aerial photo from 2010, where you can see that the creek channel highlighted in yellow has been ditched and straightened. We know in the system that's occurred system-wide. We know there's dams like the one in Arden Park that affect the system. And then urban develop, development has increased polluted runoff and fragmented the corridor of the system. Later on in the presentation, I'll show you some examples of our accomplishments focusing in this corridor. Moving on to the, uh, another portion of the Minnehaha Creek system in Minneapolis, um, we're taking our lessons learned um, by co-planning and partnership to accomplish our water resources goals with those goals of our partners, um, working at a, really a master planning level with the Minneapolis Park Board and the city 
to um, plan how we can integrate our creek improvements, stormwater management, and corridor restoration with the city and the park district's plan um, for those regional resources. And that initiative is um, just underway as well. While doing these um, regional planning approaches, the district um, works with communities like Edina, Minnetonka, all along the creek and throughout the watershed district, um, knowing where the science and the water resources needs are to integrate our work with those changes on the landscape and community goals as those opportunities arise. Um, so there's our strategic plan for how we manage water district-wide um, to protect these regional resources and our um, kind of strategic plan for the creek corridor system. I'll go over the um, Arden Park concept plan development process, the public process, and review the plan itself. The process um, consisted of uh, several public publicly noticed meetings um, in development of the plan. The notice area um, is shown on the attached map in front of you that was uh, bounded by West 50th and 56th Street and then Wooddale in France and included about 760 um, postcard mailings um, for each of the three uh, public meetings that we held. The process was initiated um, not with any ideas, but just the presentation of the district strategic objectives for this system of improving the corridor, treating regional stormwater, and then removing the dam in Minnehaha Creek, um, essentially, and restoring that creek channel um, while integrating goals for parks. To open the conversation, we asked community members um, some questions about the park. You know, how do they use the park, their issues and concerns, and desires for a future Arden Park. We took that feedback, along with the city and district strategic um, goals for the system, and produced a concept plan um, that we brought back um, to the community at a second meeting um, in November of 2016. Um, where we focus specifically on the areas of creek restoration, stormwater management, trails and facilities, getting feedback on those specific items. We took that same concept plan to a council work session, to the Parks Commission and to our Board of Managers also to get input on um, the ideas presented in that uh, draft plan. The themes of what we heard during those first two meetings um, that haven't changed throughout are really connecting with nature, um, the passive and active recreation that people appreciate, fishing, kayaking, tubing, um, the community placemaking of different um, areas of the park, particularly the dam, and then the desire for improved facilities. After meeting three, where we um, presented a final concept plan um, that showed some adjustments and then described other adjustments that could be made during a design process, um, we heard from a greater uh, contingent of the community with concerns about the key feature of Arden Park today, which is the waterfall created by the dam or what the district has referred to other times as a grade control structure in the creek, which is one of the essence of the natural resource issues that the district is hoping to, hoping to address. Um, we know at a recent council meeting, um, members of the public uh, spoke with concern about dam removal and at the council's direction, we reached out, paused the process um, of moving the concept plan forward and reached out to community members, offering up our time and um, presentation and information sharing, um, sort of starting over again um, and had two additional meetings that were noticed um, self-noticed by members of the public. We alerted everybody we had contacts to and they shared that meeting information through um, their social media um, channels and um, concerned neighbors and, and things. The first public meeting, we really just listened. We asked the people, you know, acknowledging they care about the dam 
and the unique special place that it creates at the park. And we ask people to talk about their values for the dam, um, what they like about the park, and then you know what they like about the concept plan. Um, some of the feedback we got, you know, the the specific about the dam, it forces people to get out. It engages your senses. Um, waiting with your grandchildren, um, you know, generations of people have you know enjoyed this this feature in the park. Um, people enjoyed watching kids play and fish. Um, things they enjoyed about the park were the open space, the natural state, the willow trees, the physical beauty, and wildlife. Um, a lot of really um, passionate um, feelings about the special place Arden Park is, and you know, really not consistent with what we heard all along for the um, appreciation of natural character um, that this place provides. I'll review the concept plan and our response to all this comment we have received, um, and then talk about um, how we can respond in the future too as, we, um, as the plan should move forward. Um, the basis as we started off the, off the first public meeting for the concept plan is really the creek restoration component as it's the biggest piece and most impactful component of the park project. Um, the creek alignment is shown here overlaid on the existing park conditions. The light blue line on the screen is the existing creek alignment. The dark blue line is a draft proposed alignment. Before I compare the to the draft and final concept plan and our response to comments, I'll review the features of the concept plan today. Um, starting with the creek and natural resources, you'll see there's a new creek alignment as I described. The um, project treats has the potential to treat over 100 acres of regional stormwater. Um, those potential treatment areas are kind of blue blobs highlighted, some on the north and some on the south. There's been preliminary engineering studies both by the city and the watershed district to determine um, the level of treatment and um, preliminary costs and feasibility of this work. Um, of course, there's the, the dam removal of the creek. Um, recreation um, upgrades include uh, replacement of the shelter building, um, improvements to the existing hockey rink, boards, lighting, um, new access to Minnehaha Creek, and those are shown on there um, throughout the corridor as um, sort of light brown bump outs. The um, other facilities upgrades includes lighting throughout kind of the spine um, of transportation through the park, and then there's trail upgrades, um, both new trail proposed along Brookview, um, a boardwalk and steps on the north end of the park with a new bridge to create a walking loop, and then additional trail um, along Minnehaha Boulevard to provide, um, the thought was a more recreational route for tubers and kayakers. The recreational component um, is considered in two ways. One, the dotted line in the creek on the north end of the park is depicting a canoe kayak tubing loop where you can enter and exit um, at the location of the proposed shelter building and the north bridge that's shown on the plan. You could also take, the, take a longer loop to West 54th Street where there is a portage just before 54th Street to get out of the creek. Also still uh, a recreational opportunity is kayaking or tubing below 54th Street. And I'll talk about um, how the concept plan has changed and has responded to some of those things we heard about the dam. Side by side, the draft and final concepts are very similar as this is you know, a high level um, planning exercise. Based on our feedback um, at the initial phase, the changes mostly are regarding the trail loops. We heard a lot about um, minimal upgrades 
um, keep the rustic character, um, and then some specific comments about minimizing trails and extra trail loops and those comments um, kind of continue to come through. So you'll see the final concept is missing um, uh, basically a formalized trail through the woods where today it's a really naturalized um, path just um, ad hoc created that people enjoy exploring. What the um, final concept doesn't depict in response to comments and what we've talked about and studied further is how the creek alignment can respond to concerns that include um, the recreation and aesthetic as aspect around the dam and how we can preserve trees as part of the project. Um, and then um, kind of optimizing that stream length to achieve greater slope in that area of the bridge and in that area on the north. So in a design process, what we would look at and, uh, and in, in replacement of the dam is putting additional slope um, through that corridor in response to the fishing hole and fishing concerns we studied how water works under the bridge. And you know, some specific details about what's under there. There's the, the dam itself, which is, um, it appears to be concrete over a, you know, a pile of rocks. And then below that, under the bridge, there's a concrete slab. That slab is what once formed the standing wave. It created a hydraulic jump in the water that kayakers surfed on that shifted in the floods of 14 somehow. And by the accounts from kayaker community, it doesn't form the standing wave. It doesn't mean people don't still enjoy kayaking the eddy down there and use the space for the kayaking, but that particular wave doesn't form there. Part of that concrete um, and the grade underneath the bridge is what causes the scour in the scour hole where fish hang out. We um, studied during this concept plan leaving the grades the same under the bridge and that concrete slab down below the same. So the grading to take out the grade control starts upstream of 54th, so that fishing hole continues to form. Kind of the um, rustic character and aesthetic we heard, the concept plan and the cost <laughs> estimate considers um, kind of more formal looking um, paver block um, creek accesses and what can be incorporated into design is a more rustic natural creek access and this isn't on Minnehaha Creek but it's similar um, to what we have done upstream um, on another project. So here's a rendering of the concept and um, which maybe better depicts um, you know what the natural character might still look like as it's maintained. Um, you know the the changes you know really are that the the waterfall is replaced by something that looks like rock riffles in the stream. We talked about how we would modify the design and the idea behind creating that new creek alignment to maintain slope under the bridge um, to have a visual aesthetic of flowing water and rock riffles and allow for recreation, although be it, it's different than the aesthetic of the waterfall today. The picture on the right is of Minnehaha Creek, um, where there is a steeper slope and you can see flowing water and rock riffles. Um, the fishing is preserved. Um, I talked about um, how, how that can be done. And then the recreation is you know, expanded from just at the bridge area to the north end of the park as well. So I reviewed kind of the district strategies in the creek system. You know, really it's stormwater management, improving the Minnehaha Creek channel, um, as we showed how it's been degraded, straightened, dredged, dammed throughout um, development and then how the corridor has been fragmented too as a result of development. These strategies are district-wide. We're focused in certain large regional geographies with project partners to achieve the, these goals of stormwater management, creek improvements, and corridor restoration 
while also achieving other community benefits, particularly um, you know, with parks and open space um, when we do these projects. Um, now I'd like to introduce Jonathan Kuss, our engineer, to provide you the scientific analysis and basis for how this project does these things to accomplish our, our overall goals. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Members. Happy to be here today. I threw a lot of presentation slides in to keep your interest, hopefully, at the scientific presentation here. I um, want to talk first a little bit about our credentials. Uh, we've been retained by Minahawk Creek Watershed District for this project. We've been working with them for um, close to 15 years, I think, now. I've been working with them about 12 years. Um, Interfluve is about 45 people. We're scientists, engineers spread around the country. I actually live uh, right here where your arrow is, where there's also a lot of dots here in the Twin Cities. So I'm a resident of the Twin Cities, do a lot of projects here locally. But as you can see, our firm does a lot of projects around the country, around the world. Uh, we've got people that travel a lot of places to work on moving water issues. Our specialty is river restoration around the country and around the world. We have done projects uh, like Eel River here on the picture that is out in Massachusetts. That was a dam removal and a cranberry bog restoration. Uh, we've done, oh, excuse me, we teach at Harvard, we teach at Portland State, we teach here at the University of Minnesota. So that's not our primary focus, but it is part of our outreach to the community to provide education to our peers and to the upcoming practitioners in the world. Uh, we've got people leading panels in New Zealand and China this year on river restoration. So we have a fair amount of activity uh, with that regard, regarding education of our um, of what we do in the world. Uh, we also do projects here in the Midwest quite frequently, like this here in Sheboygan. Uh, this is a constructed river reach. Uh, you're seeing something that was completely man-made in front of you there with a kayak launch on the right. In that case, we used a gravel bar. Uh, this project included uh, hogging out a lot of contaminated sediment, rebuilding an island, and rebuilding the stretch of the Sheboygan River here. And so we frequently do uh, interesting and complex projects uh, around the country. One of the things that we do uh, fairly frequently is dam removal. The uh, slide, or the portion on the left of your slide there is about uh, a sampling of our projects. We do, have done about 110 dam removal projects around the country, a lot of which are the big ones, but all of, you know, a fair number also are small ones. You see one on the right here. This one's in Massachusetts. Uh, that's the before picture. If you look very carefully in the background, you'll see a tree here. That's your point to focus on here as I switch the slide over, and that's the after shot. You can see, see that same tree in the background here with that same little strange branch formation. But uh, that's typical of our restoration projects uh, for dam removals, which we're proposing here, or supporting the district in providing the scientific basis for this particular project. So on to Arden Park and the project here. I'm going to talk about four different scientific metrics that we typically utilize to assess whether a project is going to provide ecological uplift within an area. And so these are the four areas that we as an organization are looking at on behalf of our clients when we walk in to say, is this a dam or a project that's worth doing? Here in Minnesota, one of the tools that we use is this MPCA stream habitat assessment. Uh, what you get is this form on the right. If you Google that, it's a clear form you can print out yourselves. You can walk out to the impounded area and fill it out yourself. Um, the district does this fairly regularly. They've done this in this area in 2015, and then we redid it here in 2017. Uh, the scores that were shown up there are they're in the low 30s, as you noticed, this stream habitat assessment. Uh, based on our projected project goals and the concept level designs, we think we can get closer to an 80 in that stream uh, criteria. The photo, again, that uh, Renee showed as well is of a fairly steep section of creek. Uh, we would get that in a few sections of Arden Park as we put in these riffle structures to basically take the four feet of grade drop we've got currently with a dam and spread that out throughout the park through these riffle areas. Mr. Cusa, before you move on, yes. uh, so is this on a 100-point scale? It's on a 100-point scale, correct. And, and uh, where is healthy versus where is unhealthy? I'm, I'm trying healthy to... is at 100, unhealthy is at zero. So you're essentially but, you're, but, you're <laughs> but in the scale of things, I, uh, where, where does your hair stand up? I mean, where, I, does my, yeah. <laughs> where does your hair stand up? Uh, it's all relative. I mean, there's some very degraded creeks out there that are in the teens. Uh, this scoring here in the 30s is definitely a, 
a degraded urban stream is what that it qualifies as, basically. And so 80, it would be a nice score for an urban system that's got, in this case, the potential to have what we call a riparian corridor, and I'll speak to that in a second. And, so, And does this grade uh, last... It, does it really just affect this area, or does it affect a lot of downstream as well? Do, do we see uh, benefits downstream? Excellent question. Can I come back to yes, the second? I'll uh, answer thank you. that. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, absolutely. I'll, I'll mark that. I'll get you an answer to that shortly. Um, one of the other tools we use that's more of a national tool is comes out of the NRCS. They have a stream visual assessment protocol. This is a manual that allows you to look at a lot of different stream types. We use the flatter Midwest grade in, within this protocol to assess this stream here. Um, they've got a lot of metrics that they use to look at it, whether, everything from nutrients to how much fish cover there is to how much sediment is in these riffles that you're trying to create. Uh, the current conditions are at 3.9, 0 to 10 scale again. Uh, anticipated post-project, we think we can get roughly to an 8.1. Again, just another separate assessment tool utilized to determine whether or not a particular project is going to provide ecological uplift. Uh, one of the other elements, and coming back to your question, Council Member, is this index of biological integrity. You've got uh, macroinvertebrates, uh, bugs that like to live in the creek, basically, that are a good metric by which you can assess the quality of the stream. You've got mayflies at the top there, and then you've got, uh, let's see, our caddis and craneflies there. As an engineer, I don't have all these in my head, so I check my notes. But the mayflies are more intolerant species. You've got to have cleaner, colder water generally for mayflies to be successful. Uh, craneflies, on the other hand, can tolerate worse water quality. So when you go out there to look at a stream, you're checking to see what type of bugs you have in there, and that basically yields this index, this IBI score for an urban stream. Uh, we're not going to recreate a trout stream here. We're not going to say that we're going to get a lot of mayflies and have an excellent mayfly hatch. We're just saying these are the metrics by which you assess the stream, and that's what we're using here as well. Um, it's typical range for urban streams are between 10 and 40, so we're not going to try and get to something that is going to be harboring salmon or trout here anytime soon. Current conditions, this is uh, in 2013, the district does this analysis. Uh, the stream, or this particular reach, had a score of 26. Again, based on the post-project long-term conditions, looking at this project relative to other ones we've seen in similar areas, we think we can get to about a 35 on that scale. Given the limitations of this particular system, we're not going to get to that upper range of an urban creek system. Um, to your question about does this improve downstream, so these benthic macroinvertebrates are essentially the food source for fish. And so as we try and restore this project site and we add more opportunities for these type of craters to be active and alive in this area, those are washing down through to other parts of the creek and providing food sources to that fishing hole downstream 54th as well as feeding into other parts of the creek. So you're trying to provide that cohesive corridor of a living community of bugs and fish and wading birds through there. So there is connectivity both upstream and downstream from this type of system. So, for, and forgive me, the, the corollary question then is, and I anticipate we'll hear from some people, let's not do anything here until they fix some obvious problems upstream. Uh, there's a dam at Browndale, there's a dam at Grays Bay. There, there are other places where there are dams. Why deal with this one now? I will defer to the district to answer that as a more systematic approach. Um, Mayor St or Council Stewart, members of the council, um, kind of as I discussed, the district has all this science site-specific and throughout the corridor. Um, and we know that um, the, the drivers of the, um, of the poor water quality, um, the poor stormwater, the, sto is the stormwater um, development has degraded the creek corridor, which is 22 miles from Lake Minnetonka to the chain of lakes. Um, we saw a picture of uh, demonstrating what urban development has done to the corridor in terms of the creek channel itself and the um, riparian corridor. The district's long-term vision is fixing all those problems. We do that um, in a somewhat focused, systematic way. Um, 
the way we focused in Hopkins and St. Louis Park because it is the most degraded section of the creek. We're taking lessons learned in that um, kind of focused small geography approach to Minneapolis. And then throughout the corridor as opportunities arise, we look to address those things of stormwater and ecological integrity and creek corridor um, disruption. Um, and opportunities like this with Arden Park. And then district-wide, we don't just do projects at the headwaters of Halstead Bay or the headwaters of Jennings Bay. Um, throughout the district, as opportunities arise to address these system-wide issues in an integrated way, um, we look to um, make progress towards those goals. But we know that any one project um, in Hopkins or in Edina or in Minneapolis um, won't address the system-wide issue. So the next topic in my discussion here is wetland health, but I wanted to take a moment and make sure I, I say something very clearly that I may have forgotten to say when I first introduced myself, but it, which is that if you're a river or a stream system, dams are pretty much the worst thing you can do to a river stream, is that you are taking a system that is naturally moving water and you're stopping it in place and you're holding that water back. So in terms of the big picture, just looking at a macro level, dams are bad, and so I will stick with you know, that is our contention that's usually the science and engineering that will support that uh, throughout these processes that we've been involved with like i say around the country and around the world um, the next metric that we look at uh, typically is wetland health and in this particular project you've got approximately 6.3 acres of existing wetlands uh, we're going to increase that at the end of the project on the right hand side of your screen you can see the purple line is the current wetland boundary uh, under proposed conditions you can see the shaded area and then this uh, reddish hatched area is the additional wetland area that we would be capturing within our project uh, once we complete the construction of this. The type of wetlands that we're going to get are typically going to be higher quality with this type of system that we're proposing versus a more stagnant backwater system that you get with a dam. And so that in itself is going to also be an improvement in addition to the overall quantity of wetlands increasing. The other thing is, as a part of that wetland area, is this floodplain forest. You currently have about 3.2 acres of floodplain forest. I understand we've got some nesting eagles in there. Uh, the post-project conditions, we're looking to achieve 4.9 acres. The reason floodplain forest is a particularly important element of your wetland picture is that, especially in the flyway for the Mississippi River and here in an urban area, the first areas that were encroached upon next to all of our moving water systems were these floodplain forests. They don't flood as frequently. You get trees growing up in them great spot to clear and build a home, put in your business. And so we frankly have very little floodplain forest throughout our urban creek corridors. And so this is a good opportunity here within Arden Park to expand upon that and grow our urban forest and grow that riparian corridor that is critical to a lot of species that count on putting their nests and, and making their livelihood next to moving water systems. Uh, the next area is water quality. Uh, Renee talked about this briefly. Stormwater treatment, we currently have about six outfalls that discharge directly from the residential areas into the creek. Uh, we treat zero acres of those areas. Uh, the untreated area is 113 acres. As a part of the plan for the project, uh, we're going to try and capture as much of that as possible. Again, we're at the concept phase, and so this is, again, a uh, first cut at looking at these designs, but we think we can get to at least 107 acres. We're going to try and get all 113 acres, but there's always a balance between the park space and BMPs. I mean, you could take down the playground and put a great wetland treatment system in there, but you know, maybe the playground has some community value that we want to preserve, and so we want to reflect that and reflect that within our designs here to say, look, we're going to try and get as much as we can. We're not possibly going to get all of it, but we're going to do what we can within the context of this project. Uh, one of the metrics that comes out of water quality treatment is this phosphorus loading, and that's one of the, the trigger points for a lot of the impairments along Minha Creek. Um, currently, the project uh, area, that 113 acres, creates about 82 pounds of phosphorus a year under proposed conditions. If we were able to treat that, uh, we think we can drop that down to about 54.8, which is a removal of close to 30 pounds per year of phosphorus, which not only improves the water quality within this part of the system, but all your downstream neighbors uh, are going to benefit from that type of impact. 
Uh, the next area, which is a horrible blue, which is hard to read, um, is the physical stream attributes. Um, bottom line is that we're looking to add length of channel, existing channels about 1,600 feet long, 1,570. Um, we're looking to get 2,400 feet. As Renee mentioned, we're going to probably shorten that up as a part of the value engineering effort that will occur if the project is approved so that we can get slightly steeper grades through some of these areas to get more of those riffles. Um, the other key element is these riffle areas. Those are the grocery stores of your stream. That's where a lot of the food base is generated. You currently have zero square feet of riffle area within the impounded area, the area just behind the dam there. Uh, based on our first cut concept designs, something in the order of 16,000 square feet, that number might vary a little bit, especially if we reduce the length. But when you reduce the length, you got more steepness, we might be able to maintain that number. So. Um, on the right-hand side, I keep saying riffles. For those of you that don't operate or live in the stream world the way I do, the top picture there shows a riffle. It's basically that rock within the stream. You got faster moving water going across that rock before it tails out into a pool and then goes into the next riffle. Uh, the bottom picture is projects that we just completed for Minha Creek um, up in Reach 2022 up by Methodist Hospital that uh, show kind of the more still water areas. We've got some uh, vegetation that's come in. This is within a couple of years after construction and after two years of some extensive flooding on that. So a very resilient system we've got, luckily. So in summary, the bottom line is that from all four of the metrics that we use on a standard basis to assess whether or not a project is viable or not uh, for a client, uh, these this project rates highly in terms of existing versus proposed conditions. And so that's really our take home point that across all the metrics, we have a positive net indicator that this is going to be a net benefit for the ecology of Arden Park. I do want to address floodplain and flood storage. Um, it's come up in some questions. Uh, one of the tools that we utilize is the Corps of Engineers has uh, this river analysis system, HEC-RAS, they call it for short. It's a numerical model system that you can do either one or 2D modeling. I don't want to get too far into the weeds there, but basically you're looking at where the flood waters are going to go during a system, uh, during a, a flood event. And so what we do is we take some of the numbers that you see there at the bottom of the screen for the various flow events. You're trying to look at low flows and we'll probably add another lower flow to that because we know that the creek is often very low flow. And then you look at very high flows and you try to figure out what's going to happen and make sure your system is going to be resilient and be able to reflect um, or accommodate the flows that we see in these urban systems. Uh, the photo on your right is showing the existing versus the proposed flooding area. Um, the key take home points is number one is there's minimal changes to the flooding areas. You'll see that both shapes overlap with the exception of the Great Lawn. Um, we're looking at being able to essentially dry that area out. Uh, the yellow is what is currently 100 year floodplain and is currently, excuse me, let me rephrase that, is currently flooded during the 100-year event, that statistical event. The blue hatching is the proposed uh, flood extents, and so you can see where the yellow is only shown, that's the area that will be pulled out of the areas that are regularly flooded, or at least projected to be flooded by that 100-year flood, and you can imagine uh, those smaller flood events will also have narrower boundaries for um, this con the proposed condition. Uh, the second point I want to make there in red is there's no change to flood storage, and the third one is no change to flow rates. Uh, this dam is what they call a run of river dam. It's not one of those western dams that holds a lot of water back and they let the you know, reservoir fill up and then they use that for irrigation or for um, water supplies or flood protection or anything like that. Uh, water that comes into the park goes out of the park. This dam has no storage capacity to it. Typically, dams are used for power generation, recreation, irrigation, and then flood control. And in the case of Loudoun Park Dam, you don't have any power generation, you don't have any irrigation, you don't have any flood control, and so you're left with what recreation you have in that pool behind there. Um, and that's what we're weighing against, essentially, the benefits of this tubing recreational loop that we talked about and some of the other fishing benefits that you'd see with having moving water systems up through the park. Uh, tree impacts is another question that's come up. Um, we have approximately 360 trees that have been surveyed. It does not include all the trees in the park. The little green dots there on the right side of the screen, if you can see them, are all the surveyed trees. There are some spaces here next to the ice rink as well as along Minha Boulevard that have not been fully surveyed. So we know 360 trees is a conservative low number for the number of trees in the park. 
The concept design, when we just put that uh, alignment that Renee showed you on there, the yellow is the grading impacts, and we have approximately 90 trees that are toppled and reused as part of the bank stabilization for the project. That's what we're projecting right now. Um, just for reference, the park area is about 15 acres, and this yellow blob shows about six acres of those that are impacted. Uh, the key element here is that there's a next step, that is reviewing that proposed stream alignment and deciding whether or not we want to adjust it to avoid trees. So that red line is just my PowerPoint swag at where we might tighten up some of those bends and try and make sure that we don't impact some of these critical trees in the park that we want to preserve. We are about trying to make sure that riparian corridor is vibrant and stays there as a benefit after the project. So us taking down all the big trees is obviously not a benefit. And so we purposely try and go out there and survey every last tree and make sure that our alignments, as much as we possibly can, can avoid the trees that we need to avoid. And the next uh, question that might be in your mind is, well, why, why do you have the squiggly line in here? You know, what's the justification for that? Uh, this is the 1940 aerial that um, I pulled up today on this earliest that I could find. Uh, you'll note here's the dam. Um, you'll note the old oxbows there. You can see where the water was originally, probably going around the corner there in more of a tortuous meander. And then I'm going to point out where the stream is at the north end of the park without arrow. And then I've aligned the 1964 photo to show you just how that's changed even since then. You can see the dams oddly stayed, stayed in place, good thing. Um, and the bridge is still there. But that meander, you can see that's really filled in already there adjacent to Minha Boulevard. That's uh, more of a treed area, still probably fairly wet. And then the stream was over here where currently your playground facility was. And so your stream's been straightened and moved farther over to the left, probably to make more room for the recreational facilities there. So this is what we use is this aerial photograph forensic evidence to go back and take a look at where do we think the stream channel was, how tortuous of a meander was this, we look at similar stream reaches that haven't been as aggressively impacted with urban development, and we try and figure out how closely we can replicate that with our designs. And so with that, I think I hand this back over to Renee. Members of the council, we talked about, um, you know, there's the science that supports why, why Arden Park and how Arden Park fits into um, repairing this regional system. Minnehaha Creek is a regional resource um, that goes through the city of Edina. Um, it drains to downstream significant regional lakes, um, including Lake Hiawatha and the Minneapolis Chain of Lakes. Lake Hiawatha is currently also on the impaired waters list, which um, is some of the um, justification for um, really understanding and treating stormwater. Um, we do all this work again, um, not just one off, um, come in and remove the dam in the way this conversation started, but in partnership with communities to not just address the stormwater, the creek corridor, and um, the natural resources goals, but the community benefits as well. Um, and as I reviewed the park plan, um, We've got amenities such as a replacement shelter. Um, we've got access, passive and active, to the creek. We're expanding um, access and opportunities for fishing. Um, and those will be done by design, as you heard. Um, our consultant team is expert in creating um, opportunities for fishing and different types of fishing. Um, so that's definitely a design consideration if it moves forward. Um, Overall park function and use, I understand from Anne that green space isn't programmed today because of its wetness and sogginess through much of the year. By dropping the elevation of the creek channel, we allow that green space to be drier and more usable. And then with the more active play area in the north, which is new, that provides a shorter tubing loop or the opportunity for a longer, longer tubing loop and still the opportunity to have recreation around um, the 54th Street Bridge, there's an expanded opportunity for recreation um, within the park as well. Um, going back to what happens when we do a, a project as big as Arden Park, um, moving a creek channel is a, is a big deal and it is disruptive um, to the landscape. And I'll review um, three projects upstream um, before, during, after construction. This is behind Methodist Hospital, where we worked with the hospital um, to address um, 
floodplain management. Their campus is primarily in the floodplain, um, and they've had issues with hospital access, um, the need to expand and meet regulatory requirements, and to manage stormwater. They've used the creek restoration in their backyard as an amenity to the hospital. And here's some pictures of what that looked like during construction. You can see the gravel bed that was um, made in the new creek channel. Um, this is for fish spawning. You can see how we make new creek banks with the installation of wood. Um, in this case, the wood was brought into site. You saw the picture behind the hospital. It was an open marsh, so we didn't have wood. Wood harvested, trees taken down as part of the Arden Park project would be reused to add wood to the stream channel. We have studies that have identified the lack of woody debris in the stream channel as one of the issues um, that affect um, quality of the stream function. This is um, you know, in two months after that channel was dug. And this is that same year in September. Um, so the site greens up fast. Um, it recovers quickly. The old channel alignment follows that grove of trees you can see sort of on the top of the picture in the skyline. This is an aerial of that creek system. Methodist Hospital Project is on the very right on the, um, you'll see uh, Louisiana Boulevard and Excelsior Boulevard along the bottom. The creek channel here followed the tree line. We talked about the impacts of urbanization and I showed you some of the pictures in this area where the creek's been ditched and straightened and this is one of those areas. We um, re-meandered the creek channel um, and then we also managed um, about 80 acres of regional stormwater that went into this creek untreated. Here's some pictures during construction um, similar to Methodist Hospital where we used woody debris to build banks. Here's the following spring when things are greening up. Later that year, actually it's, this is the following year, um, the initial year after construction is when the floods of 2014 happened. The entire project was underwater and there was no definable channel. And the, um, by design, the new channel was connected again to its floodplain, utilized its floodplain and provided floodplain storage in this case. And then um, you'll see this picture is actually the following year in 2015 where we um, installed a boardwalk for um, access to the creek and there's some new wood duck houses that were installed by Eagle Scouts, I think, for this project. Um, here's another picture of that project that year in 2015. And um, the access to the resource um, that we provided. Each of these projects is unique. It's in a unique area with unique goals. This project was in partnership with the city of Hopkins and actually was initiated um, by the city's desire through their master planning process in 2009 to address crime, the highest crime response rate in the city, which was a pocket park um, behind these buildings. It intersected with this focus area of the watershed district. I talked about how um, the highest amount of pollution goes into the creek through this area, and we are interested in regional stormwater management and expanding the creek corridor and green space of the corridor. We purchased the buildings, worked with the city to master plan this park area, and this is a picture of that master planning process we did with the city and the community. The park provides open space, connection to the resource, which was once hidden by buildings and really out of sight. It provides an upgraded playground facility, a community garden. And last year, the city um, built a new park shelter pavilion um, on the site, which was um, prepared for as part of the um, initial project construction. I know. Um, in Arden Park, um, the restoration is unique like all these restorations. We're addressing community goals. The community appreciates the rustic character of the park, the connection to nature, um, the fishing, um, and the community really appreciates this um, natural aesthetic of the waterfall. Um, through the um, concept planning and design process, um, really much of the 
um, community's goals and the city's goals identified in the strategic plan for parks with upgrading facilities, managing stormwater, connecting people to nature, and um, providing um, educational opportunities can be accomplished with this master plan and with this project. The change is at the dam um, and the waterfall. There's no doubt that's an attractive feature and that it's, you know, iconic and rememberable to the community. Um, we talked about that, what that might look like with a steeper slope and rock riffles, still with access, still with fishing, still with the opportunity to tube or kayak, but that experience would change and be, be a bit different. Um, with this master plan, however, a lot of those activities get spread um, more throughout the park and I think um, really are an exciting opportunity to address you know, the district's goals in this regional system, but um, our shared goals for Arden Park. I'll let Ann wrap up with the project budget and schedule for moving forward. So, uh, thank you, Mayor Hovland, members of the council. I'd like to, uh, to briefly touch on the financial elements of the project, and we have it broken down into uh, four different categories. And I'd like to touch on uh, which part of each category is the responsibility of the city and which is the responsibility of the watershed district. And the first is in the park facilities. And in the park facilities area, uh, the entire part of this is the responsibility of the city. But what we would like to point out here is that 50% of the assets are replacement of our current assets, and 50% are new assets. And the new assets would be lights, uh, a patio behind the shelter building, a potential green roof, and some additional native landscaping. And we'd like to replace the shelter building, the playground, and the existing hockey rink with lights. The second area is in uh, paths, trails, and uh, nature. And that is a combination of uh, city expense and watershed district expense. We would be replacing approximately 15% of our existing park assets, specifically in some paths and the, uh, the main bridge that goes from the shelter side of the creek to the uh, skating rink or the hockey rink side of the creek. And uh, the cost split for the, uh, for the funding source for this area is 70% city and 30% district. And we've listed uh, the individual funding sources, potential funding sources for that area. The next area is in creek restoration, and that is 100% uh, of the watershed district's responsibility. Uh, we do have some efficiencies that we feel we would be achieving by doing this creek project in addition to the uh, park improvement uh, uh, projects that need to occur at some time. Uh, we feel that there are efficiencies of scale, that there are mobilization and restoration efficiencies, and at the same time we'd be able to increase uh, park drainage and the uh, flood risk management. And the next area is in stormwater, and that is a 50-50 share between the city and the watershed district. And some new things I think were, were pretty well highlighted by Jonathan in his part of the presentation, but we would be uh, working on clean water, um, helping to uh, reduce water pollution. We would be increasing national, nat natural resource restoration and improve aesthetics in the area. Uh, to tie in a little bit more uh, closely with funding sources, um, you'll see some uh, classifications currently unfunded. So this is all on the city side of uh, the funding needs. And uh, as you can see, the park assets, uh, uh, essentially $1.243 million, are currently unfunded uh, in the construction fund. Uh, we do have some funding sources identified in the capital construction side uh, from the stormwater utility and the uh, PACS franchise fees. Um, those um, areas could be earmarked, but they are not currently approved uh, because we don't have a 2019 budget yet. Uh, 
From the uh, operating budget side of things, uh, we're looking to the operating budget to help pay for some of the design and bidding part of the project. Uh, we would be looking at um, some allocations in our 2018 and 2019 uh, budgets, the majority of that design from the city standpoint would occur in 2018. Uh, we would be looking at the Parks and Recreation uh, Professional Services budget, and again, um, some allocations from the Stormwater Utility and the uh, PACS franchise fee, the Pedestrian and Cycling Safety Fund franchise fee. A little bit about the timeline for the project. Um, obviously, the first step is approval of the concept plan and agreement with the watershed district uh, from the city council. After that, the watershed district needs approval from their board of managers. And then in terms of the project construction and uh, design and construction, I should say, uh, even uh, yet in 2017, we would begin working with the watershed district on the preliminary design for the creek and the stormwater uh, portions of the project. And we are also very actively um, soliciting grant possibilities for this project. In uh, the beginning of 2018, we would start the design of the park and trail facilities, and we'd be looking at approximately 60% design check-in by the end of the second quarter. By the third quarter in 2018, we'd be at 90% plan check-in. And I, I should make note, too, that there would be another significant public process as uh, we would be entertaining the design phase, and we would also have the Parks and Rec Commission uh, help lead that process. Um, we've had uh, two commission members and oversight by the Parks and Rec Commission uh, so far, and we would like that. Uh, to continue, we would have a public process in terms of playground design, we would have a public process in terms of park shelter design, and also uh, we'd have check-ins with the community on uh, final design and also the Parks and Rec Commission and City Council. Uh, we'd be looking at uh, awarding bids in uh, the third quarter of 2018 for the city portion, um, excuse me, for the watershed district. Uh, portion uh, to begin creek construction, the utilities and stormwater portion of the project uh, during the winter of uh, 2018 to 2019. And then in 2019 is when the construction of the park amenities could take place. So with that, eventually we would like to ask the City Council to approve the Arden Park concept plan and authorize the Mayor and City Manager to sign the agreement with the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District. With that, we'd like to stand to answer any questions. Improvement of water quality in the creek. And I actually had that question last night over at the uh, Arden Park uh, Night to Unite was, a couple of different um, inquiries on that same issue, and one was, you know, no, understanding it's a 22-mile corridor for the creek. Uh, how can you improve water quality in the creek over such a short expanse of uh, space? You know, maybe it's a eighth of a mile with a meander or something. And that was one of the questions one of the residents had for me. And I said, "My, we can certainly ask that question, and we'll ask, ask that question. So if you could answer that question, that would be helpful." Mayor, members of the council, the water quality portion is in intercepting the stormwater runoff off the streets. In Arden Park, there's, um, Jonathan pointed at six discharge sites, and we, we'd be looking at intercepting um, as much of that water as possible and providing um, treatment of that. Within the corridor, the district is doing projects up and down the corridor. We're you know, with the city of Minneapolis and Park District, we're master planning how do we incorporate stormwater um, into the park system and as part of um, reconstruction and redevelopment and park improvements um, through that corridor. Upstream, we have um, actually installed infrastructure uh, for the treatment of almost 300 acres of drainage that goes through a trunk storm sewer into Minnehaha Creek. It takes part of Edina, Hopkins, and St. Louis Park, and the treatment of that water will actually occur at the 325 Blake site as part of that redevelopment project. 
um, the uh, projects I showed you um, in the preserve and in and Hopkins also included regional stormwater components in Hopkins underneath the green space we treated 30 acres of regional stormwater and a pipe gallery um, and this project provides um, you know about equal uh, stormwater treatment pollution removal as we did up there um, so all these opportunities one of the components that we aim to achieve is the stormwater treatment. It's an issue that's cumulative throughout the system. We know where the big sources are coming from. Hopkins and St. Louis Park is the biggest sources. Obviously, the further downstream you get, um, you know, pollution increases um, just because of urbanization. So it's something we achieve um, incrementally as part of our um, systems approach. So with that system approach on uh, the intercept of stormwater coming into the uh, into the district, into the watershed district. Is that the most profound sort of effect that you can have on uh, improving water quality, as opposed to some of the other things that you're proposing to do in the stream bed itself? Yeah, in terms of treating, improving water quality, which the quality of water in the creek and the quality of water in the lakes downstream are driven by what, you know, essentially in the system, what runs off the landscape. So treating that water as it runs off the landscape before it enters the resource is the most effective thing to do. Once it's in the system, um, it, the, the, pol the, the pollution's there and it's, it's not effectively treated anymore. Okay, and then the same person asked me last night and I think, I hope I characterize her question properly, but her, she said that on your website, you don't, you don't maintain that the project you did up in Hopkins or St. Louis Park in terms of their re-meander, that those things actually were intended to improve water quality. They were intended to accomplish other goals. What would your comment be about that? Um, those projects both, just like Arden Park, um, uh, kind of were aiming at our three objectives in the corridor of stormwater management, um, restoring erosion and creek channel damage as a result of urban, urbanization, and then expanding and repairing the creek corridor and green space next to the creek while connecting people um, to the resource. Those projects accomplished all those three things, um, each uh, by having a stormwater component where we're intercepting a large area of runoff from the landscape and treating it before it discharges into the creek, um, and then by doing channel restoration itself um, and corridor restoration and expansion itself, um, adding vegetation adding, um, taking away buildings um, that were right next to the creek. So um, like Arden, those projects did those three things. Okay, one other question from last night was, um, somebody asked me what improvements can be made by the city without doing the restoration project, or, or do you view them as inter, so interrelated that we wouldn't want to do one without the other? We certainly could do uh, city park improvements without this overall project. Uh, we feel that we have been charged to try to figure out through our strategic plan um, to figure out partnership opportunities, uh, to figure out alternative funding sources, potential grant opportunities, to not only improve our existing assets, but to try to improve the overall park environment. We could replace a park shelter building. If we replaced a park shelter building, we'd be going to the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District and asking them for a permit. If we built a, a replacement structure in the existing location, uh, we would be probably prohibiting uh, a project like this uh, from happening sometime in the future. We feel that this is smart planning uh, to take an overall comprehensive look at the site, looking at it from a park asset standpoint, uh, from a stormwater uh, treatment standpoint and looking at it from an environmental standpoint and then certainly from a recreational standpoint as well. We feel like we're just looking at the entire site uh, comprehensively as opposed to just picking out individual uh, park elements. Okay, other questions from council members? Okay. Member Brindle? I've got a few more too but I think somebody else should take should be able to ask some questions here. Member Brindle. Thank you. Uh, in the concept plan that was shown, um, there's a boardwalk. There are also maybe some other walking paths. Are they pervious? Are they concrete? What are they planned to be? 
Um, Council Member Brindle, members of the council, there on the north loop where there's a proposed new walking bridge, there's a section of boardwalk um, towards uh, um, Brookview, and that leads to a set of stairs to get up the rest of that slope. The rest of the paths are replaced either um, with concrete, um, sidewalk, or asphalt. And in our cost estimate, we factored a what we'd call a bid alternate to get a substitute price for pervious pavers. And the way that's written into the agreement is that the watershed district could elect to, if it's an extra cost, which it often is, could elect to pay that extra cost to substitute one of those um, pervious surface asphalt or concrete for pavers. Well, for me, that would be preferred. Um, I'm, I've heard from residents as well that they would prefer a pervious service rather than impervious. Um, understanding that the steps probably need to be concrete, that that's fine, but um, but p trying to make any at grade uh, surface be uh, be pervious. Um, looking at um, improvements in water quality improvements in um, the stuff that's washed into the creek. Um, I guess I would like your advice on what kind of education we need to have as residents on how once, once this work is done, if it, if it moves forward, how do we maintain it so that in 10 years, in 15, 20 years, we're not back where we are today? Mm -hmm. um, residential inputs from yards, grass clippings, yard waste is part of it. A large part of it is what we put on our streets to keep us safe in the winter, the sand and the salt. Um, what commercial parking lots use in the winter, sand and salt. Um, so those, those practices play a large part into it. Um, there will always be those inputs and um, the purpose of these treatment systems is to treat and capture um, those inputs so they do require maintenance. Um, so it's a combination of doing smart things as you know, business owners and community and residents on keeping um, the streets clean um, and also um, just the general maintenance that these systems provide. Um, Okay. Natural materials like grass clippings and leaves um, leave some phosphorus uh, in the water. Uh, trees are also natural. Do they not impart phosphorus in the water? All those, all those things are inputs to phosphorus. The, um, it goes in the water and um, decays mm -hmm. and you know, depletes oxygen. Um, part of that is, you know, natural and part of a system. You know, the, those, that layer of a forest um, is ecologically productive, like other pieces of the forest in terms of runoff and its contribution to water quality. Some of that um, is in the water itself um, dissolved. Some of it's in the things that run off the streets into the water, but the biggest contribution and the thing we're aiming to treat is the stormwater runoff, what washes off the streets okay. um, to right. the storm sewer. Okay. Uh, let's see here. A uh, couple people mentioned the south end of the park gets soggy and wet. Um, is, is the re-meandering going to correct that? Council, that is one of the community benefits of the park. By lowering the stream channel, taking out the dam, that um, we showed you a, a image of how the flood plain changes, and that provides a drier green space. Oh, okay, so that's predicated on removing the dam. Correct. Okay, all right. Uh, let's see here. Um, Marianne Martinek was here early, earlier in community comment talking about um, the creek near Brookside Terrace, and I'm familiar with that. 
Um, and it's north of the Browndale Dam is where she is. And so the, um, the stagnant water that builds up and the silt then that builds up because the water isn't moving is what she's experiencing when she says the water is ankle deep. Uh, and that also, ex that also is experienced by residents in the Mill Pond area. So, um, so while that is not inherent in this project, it is something that I can understand how this project is part of a larger comprehensive project to move water through the creek. Mm -hmm. The Browndale Dam is likely historic because it's part of the, the Mill Pond area of Edina, which is historic. But at the same time, it may be, it may be time to think about the, the health of the creek since the dam is no longer being used. But, um, but staying, with the, staying with the topic at hand, um, let's see. Um, That is, yeah, that's all I have. All right, thank you. Thank you. Member Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, I want to offer my apology to Mr. Kusa for my earlier interruption. I, I, I intended to just get clarification about what we were looking at, and I think we got deeper into it than I intended. So sorry about that. Um, I, I have a, a number of thoughts about uh, this, and it seems to me that there's um, I'm hearing a lot of common things from people on all sides of this issue. The, the first and most important, I hear from the residents uh, uh, on both sides of this issue. I hear from the watershed district and I hear from the park and rec department uh, and staff generally that, that everybody loves this park. They love the natural state of the park uh, and they want to maintain that essential character. Um, and, and so I want to help sort out s some of the other uh, things I've been hearing and figure out what's uh, the real state of, uh, of the intentions here. Um, uh, so there's been some suggestion that there is an intention to do some Disneyfication of Arden Park, that uh, make it more like Centennial Lakes. Uh, uh, Director Catry, maybe you're the one to respond to this. The, the, the kinds of things that would be going on in Arden Park besides the, the work on the stream, uh, is it retaining the rustic beauty of this area or is, is it some more paving over of things? Member Stewart, um, thank you for the question. I have heard that as well and, and honestly, I don't see any correlation uh, between the two. Um, definitely we are proposing some new park assets in terms of a shelter building. Um, for some reason, I think that there is a misconception in the community that we are planning a really large type of a facility there that would host special events and private functions similar to the facility at Centennial Lakes. Um, that has never been discussed. It has never been considered there. I would envision a park shelter building of similar size to the recent ones that, uh, that we have constructed. Sort of like the one at Pamela? Uh, potentially the one at Pamela, Countryside, or even Weber Park. Um, we haven't really um, started to talk any uh, design for a park shelter building, but it would be with uh, the same types of features and utilization that we would be proposing for other facilities. So that's one thing that I have heard specifically. Um, to Member Brindle's earlier question, um, you know, about pavement treatments, um, we certainly are also concerned about um, impervious surfaces being added to the park. Um, but one thing that I hear regularly from residents is um, they like the ability to be able to uh, walk loops around a park or have different trails so that they can stay within a park. Uh, we heard that as part of this process, and that's what we're intending is just to give residents uh, different opportunities to get to different parts of the park that they may not currently be able to get to safely. Um, but other than that, no, I, I don't see any similarities between this and Centennial Lakes Park. One of the uh, 
indicators that I think some people get concerned about is when they hear about lights. Uh, I think there are currently lights at the ice rink there, is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, but there are not lights on the Great Lawn where we have winter skating, is that right? That is correct. And the intention, uh, or maybe it's unclear yet, where you intend to have lights, I, I don't, I, it's not clear to me, so maybe you can address that. Certainly, Member Stewart, and, and we, ha we are not into final design yet, and that is certainly something that can be changed, but uh, the one thing that we did hear throughout the process, and I continue to hear regularly, we just heard it um, significantly through the Fred Richards Park process, is where you have a main spine of a park trail, um, people are interested in having some path lighting there, just some very low level light the path only type of lights. Oh, it's and that's a foot off the ground thing that mm -hmm, exactly. lets you see where you're walking. Yes, and that's what we're proposing here. We are proposing replacing the hockey lights um, that we have there currently. Okay. Um, and the winter skating on the Great Lawn area, uh, that's really just a daylight thing then. It's not a, even though it's a short day. Correct. <laughs> okay. Um, the, um, the loss of trees, and I believe the measurement on the trees when they count this large number is a four inch bowl on the tree, is that right? If anything four inch or greater comes in the survey? For this survey it was eight inches. Eight inch or greater, okay. Um, and uh, I think it was uh, Mr. Kusa who said that uh, or maybe as you, Ms. Clark, said the final design, and you're trying to redesign it to avoid affecting quite so many trees? Right, Council. The alignment, um, the first step of a design process would look at that alignment um, in the field and, how, and avoiding trees, and again, adjusting length to provide slope in that area, those areas of interest and recreation. Right. So tree preservation, we don't have a number, um, but using this conservative estimate. Um, okay, but at, to the extent possible, any trees that would be impacted, you'd try to remove those and replant them in the area to, to help with erosion and such? So the trees would be taken down with their roots, not cut, and reused in creating new banks in the creek, um, like the pictures I've shown. Um, would, would you typically succeed in doing that with 80% of the trees, or what's the, what's the typical? We would use 100% of whatever trees we took oh. and, and in the creek, and you know, depending on the length of creek and the design, how many trees are impacted, um, the cost estimate assumes bringing in um, wood for those purposes. Um, but then the, the um, restoration plan brings in of, you know, trees, and there's a whole replanting plane for the floodplain forest, um, as well as the corridor and um, invasive species management. And uh, there were some, we had some constituents ask specifically about the willow trees. Mm -hmm. uh, do they get affected or is that? Um, one of the express purposes of that new alignment is avoiding those willow trees um, that we see in all these pictures of right. the dam. Um, I want to ask about uh, fishing. I, so one of the things people love is being able to fish in this area. Um, if, if I have a correct understanding of the materials I read, it sounds to me like there will be more opportunities for great fishing all through the park instead of just at this one spot at the south end. Is that That's accurate? That's correct. And, and w will the fishing change? Will it be a different diversity of fish or what, will it be sort of the same types of fish that are there today or what, what can we expect? The fish that are in the creek today are, um, you know, are from our lake fish, and the same species that we find in the creek today would be the same species um, that are in the creek, you know, next year or after the project. So um, it's clear that the project, and you showed pictures that I think very clearly show that when the project is underway, you're bringing in heavy equipment. Because uh, the only way you can re-meander the stream is to use heavy equipment. To, I imagine that heavy equipment was used to straighten it at one point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that, that's what's needed to unstraighten it. Um, and, and so there will be a period of time and the trees will be being pulled down and then being put back up. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to look 
pretty bad for a while. Is that a fair statement? That is a fair statement, and I hope I demonstrated that yeah. um, in the pictures that the, the park, the entire park, will be a construction zone for, uh, I would say, one year. Okay, but it, it does look like it recovers pretty rapidly based on some of that photographic evidence you showed us. Correct. The, um, I, my concern during that construction phase, people have written to us about, uh, apparently, and I haven't seen any of these at Arden Park, apparently there's an eagle there, there's a red fox, there's a blue heron. Um, will those animals be chased away by this heavy equipment? Will they, will they be there when this is all done? I, I don't know what to expect in terms of the larger wildlife. That's an excellent question. The, the answer really is that we don't know. We've, we've worked on projects around bald eagles where they've st stuck with heavy construction going on right adjacent to them. And we've had heron rookeries that have disappeared when we've been working a half mile away. And so it, it, there's some variables there that we, we can't account for. But um, we have worked on a lot of very natural project sites. You're right, in general, those red foxes, the animals that will and can vacate over that temporary construction period will do so but then they'll return the wild turkeys and the foxes and the herons and the eagles will generally reoccupy those spaces very quickly once that, that construction is complete. Well, thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, those are all my questions. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you, Member Stewart. Uh, Member Stoughton? Thank you. Um, let me just start by thanking you for the presentation. It was really informative, thorough, and I appreciate all of your efforts to, uh, to engage with the community, to be answering a ton of questions from me, I'm sure from other members of the community. And I'm learning a lot every single time I talk about this, and it's largely thanks to your work. So thank you for that. Um, I just want to go back and, and try to understand a little context. And I have a few questions that may zigzag all over the place. Um, does anybody know why this dam was there in the first place? How it got there? Do we know anything about that? Okay. I know, Mr. Cousy, you had, you had mentioned the three kind of logical reasons for dam irrigation and uh, power and recreation. And recreation. So perhaps there was farming or something somewhere along the line. Correct. Okay. Um, in I went back and looked at some of the work from the 2013-2014 um, bridge project, and there was a pretty robust engagement process at that time, and I know lots of um, really um, deja vu comments. <laughs> sounded very similar to the comments that we've been getting now. Um, and at the time, I had the sense that there was um, a decision not to do anything with the creek but that seemed to change with this 2014 um, Memorandum of Understanding. And I'm wondering, I don't know, Ms. Katria, if it's you or Ms. Clark, if you have any sense of just can you help me with the, when the pivot changed? Was there, was there some event that changed the thinking about whether to tackle this um, particular section of the creek? Um, the, the idea to tackle this particular issue on the creek arose when, you know, in our interactions of sharing information with staff and knowing that 54th Street Bridge was being replaced and there was a planning process undertaking. So the district raised our hand and said that intersects with the known issue of the dam on the creek. So we worked with the city and, um, you know, solicited um, feedback about, about the dam and our, you know, the opportunity to remove it um, with the bridge. And you heard a little bit of the history about how that evolved. The thinking and so of, that was some of the archaeological dig I did, looking at the materials yeah. that from that community engagement. And it was pretty, I got the sense you walked away at that point saying, well, we're not going to do anything with this. You know, when we, we, when we, um, when we walked away, it was from taking the, the dam out. Right. And we looked at, well, it's when you replace a bridge, it's a 50, 100 year opportunity. And so what's the you know, minimal opportunity for the resource that we could achieve if not the dam? And it was this bypass pipe that allows for fish passage, you know, kind of a directing a small issue in this system. 
and that was designed, it was included in the bid package, and while the bridge plans were delayed, um, a lot of the feedback and pushback, the vocal group at the time was this kayaker community that loved that standing wave. Um, so with their support, we felt that you know, re-engaging on that issue of the dam was back on the table. We also heard community comment of the pipe is, you know, a, a big investment. It was a hundred, you know, hundred and fifty thousand in that range of an extra um, for fish to sometimes be able to traverse. Um, the district's approach. Um, you mentioned the memorandum of understanding in 2014. Um, during that work in in 2010, the district's philosophy and approach of doing our natural resource work has changed. And right in 2014, was right, right in the middle of how, when we um, formalized a new uh, a policy approach to accomplishing our mission, which is in partnership with our communities, which is integrating land, our, our natural resource goals with community goals and um, uh, you know, leveraging um, co-planning and leveraging each other's investments. So instead of approaching a dam removal project, um, because it you know, does intersect with the street project, we um, have taken you know, a, a different approach, and that's reflected in our um, comprehensive plan, how we you know, have a, di a, a large portion of science that diagnose issues, but the approach to doing work is like we outlined in our 2014 Memorandum of Understanding, co-planning really early, um, for redevelopment, for infrastructure projects, sure. for park projects, and finding those intersections of efforts um, where we can accomplish your goals and our goals. Okay, I think that's pretty helpful. So just so I'm getting it right, we, we had some discussion about it at the time because of the, the kind of sentiment from the community. The alternative was let's see if we can do the fish bypass. Eventually we decided not to do it. Then the the, the events happened, the, the storms happened in 2014 that did something to this standing wave. And given that a lot of the vocal um, participation was from the kayaking community, when you then checked with them about that, then they didn't seem as, as, um, as opposed to it. And so that's what kind of started the thinking again about maybe revisiting this issue. Correct. Okay. Um, and, and while we're kind of on the topic and, I, and the community stuff that you brought up, it, you described some of the projects you've done. Is it fair to say that this is the first one in a, in a pretty, um, I don't know what the right description is, but a pretty robust park? I mean, you mentioned the one in Hopkins, but it sounds like mm -hmm. that was a rescue effort that everybody was happy to have an right. improvement of that park no matter what. Is this the first project that you've had that's in a pretty active park in a pretty densely populated area? Um, in, in terms of community engagement in recent history, we did some big work um, in Minneapolis around the chain of lakes, um, you know, going back a couple of decades now. Okay. But in, in recent history, I think this is um, kind of the most robust engagement and community participation um, co-planning process that we've, we've done. Um. Switching gears just a little bit, um, Ms. Katre, you talked about the uh, strategic parks plan um, that I recall from my first year on the council. It's a very big document, very comprehensive. I know a lot of work went into it. Um, it you talked about a bunch of big concepts in terms of um, natural resource protection, et cetera. Does that strategic plan address any specifics with any of our parks and any kind of sp particular projects? Not specifically, Member Staunton. Um, we talk a lot in generalities, but one of the things that we didn't call out Arden Park specifically, but we talked about uh, opportunities to be able to provide better access to the creek or our water resources. Okay. Uh, we don't so both have recreation and natural resources kind of notion. Exactly, okay. yes. We don't have a lot of opportunities to, the, to do that right. in our park, so this is a really great opportunity okay. to have and, that. And next. I thought you did a nice job of identifying the concepts in the strategic plan that support what, what we're trying to talk about here. Um, uh, 
there was some discussion about public process, and, and Ms. Katra, you talked about the fact that there will be another step in this process that will also engage the park board and public hearings and the like. Um, I'm wondering, Ms. Clark, if there's a similar public process um, at the district. And I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with this. We have a bit of a catch-22 here. We're talking about these concepts, and a lot of the conversation and questions we've had really go into details about how it's going to be designed and what's this feature, what's that feature. And I'm trying to figure out, and I'm wondering if you can just help me with, how, how those um, concerns get built into the process if we decide to move forward. I'm trying to figure out when do, when, if I say I'm willing to go ahead at this stage, when do I get another voice in this on behalf of the constituents in our community? Can I answer that quickly before I pass it off to Renee and, and she can answer as well? Um, I can tell you that we haven't laid out a design for what our public process would be uh, for the next steps. Uh, we've been just trying to get to this next sure. step first of all, but if you'd like, we'd be happy to, uh, to lay out what we would envision for a public process for the next stage of design. We could do that for the next meeting. And I get, well, and I guess that, I, I'm not necessarily looking for that, I'm just trying, I mean, I understand the fact that there's gonna be some money invested in order to do some of the designing, and that's, you have to decide whether you're willing to spend some money. Um, but I also wanna know that there's a way, that there's a public process that people can engage in during that design process to be speaking up about various details, because it's clear we have a very, educated um, community that has a lot of strong feelings about those different design details. Is there anything to add on that, Ms. Clark? Um, not to add in, um, not to in invent a process on the fly like Ann said, I think we'll talk about it, but um, one thing we did during the um, concept plan development process that could be um, expanded upon is we used a technical team um, of park board staff, district staff, and city staff. Um, that team could be expanded um, to more of a committee. Um, is something we could discuss um, that was more inclusive. Um, standard with our projects and, you know, we talked about as staff contemplating um, the pen to paper has to be done to um, really work on incorporating these feedbacks and provide detailed responses. Here is how this might work. What do you think? And about a 50% design is what's programmed into the agreement where there's an actual decision point. And leading up to that, there would be public input um, in uh, at least the um, usual way to solicit feedback. So council had that prior to making a decision, but I think um, with the plan development that staff would want to work to, you know, come up with a process that was inclusive and had um, participation and buy-in in the development along the way. So on that point, and, and Mr. Kusa, maybe you can weigh in here. I, I got the sense from your presentation that, you know, we're, we're always trying to balance these various, there's an ecological um, priority, there's recreation, um, there's, um, what's the other dynamic, um, cost, those are the three, recreation, cost, ecological, and I'm trying to get a sense for how you balance those as you go through this design process, and I, maybe Ms. Clark, maybe Mr. Kusa, if you can speak to that a little bit so I have a sense of, you know, there's been a lot of discussion that frames this as a really binary either or, mm -hmm. but the more I'm learning about it, the more I'm realizing that there's a sliding scale of retaining some recreation while getting some ecological and how much ecological benefit are you getting for how many dollars? And can you talk just a little bit about that set of trade-offs? Mm -hmm. um, I can take an initial um, start. The, um, you know, the, the, the project goals, the, the main opportunity here from a water resource perspective in the creek is removing the dam. So starting there, but knowing that we want to maintain, you know, slope and function there, um, just um, doing some engineering on how much slope we want in certain lengths of channel can give so you. So just a to interrupt for a second. So, so let's say, and I don't know that this is the number, but let's say it's a four-foot drop where the dam is now, and you know, 
if you changed it to two two-foot drops, I assume you're getting some ecological improvement and retaining some um, recreation. You could then go to, you know, four one-foot drops and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How, how do you go about figuring out where the right balance is between those? Um, we know we want steeper slope at the bridge and we know we want some steeper slope at the north. We can say, here's how much channel length we have to work with to give us this much steeper slope to put in those places. Then where are the trees that we want to avoid? Then put pen to paper to create a ecologically functioning um, alignment with the length of channel that gives you the slope in those two spots. So, um, and then, you know, length of channel gives you a cost as well. And we have a, a budgeted estimate, so that's, so those are the factors Yeah, and so I wanna hear from Mr. Cusa too, but, but before you do that, um, from a district perspective, when you take it back to your Board of Governors, do they have a kind of cost-benefit analysis they go through about, you know, if you're only going to get, whatever, you know, a pound of phosphorus reduction and it's going to cost you $10 million, is there, some, is there some analysis you go through from that perspective to say that it just isn't worth the lift that we're going to have to go through? Yes, for stormwater management, that, that calculation is much more straightforward. Okay. And we've got a lot of project comparables, and it's weighed against the amount of treatment and the opportunity and the benefit you get. For the ecological lift metrics, it's um, dollars and pounds of phosphorus aren't as straightforward in the, um, in the measure for how long to make the stream channel, for example. But in stormwater management, um, there, but, there is a tipping But ultimately, point. in approving a project, your Board of Governors is really trying to make a judgment about whether it's worth expending this amount of money to get this amount of benefit. The, um, yes, and that's, um, the, the, our Board of Managers is in the same position where we've got a concept plan that would be advanced into right. design and then checked those assumptions and opportunities checked at 50% design to see what's achievable. Okay, okay, thanks. Member Stoughton, that's a great question. Um, for many of our clients, Manhattan Creek included, uh, removal of a dam is kind of like building a house. You do it once and you get through it and then you decide you may never want to do it again. And so it's just one of those things that we see that regularly in terms of how these projects go forward. Uh, in terms of your question, um, relative to the binary nature of some of these decisions, uh, I'm lucky I work in the science and engineering realm. Water's gonna flow downhill, it's gonna carry water, and it's gonna carry sediment with it. I can tell you what's gonna happen there. Relative to the species in the stream, you've got northern pike, you've got bass, you've got walleye, you've got mostly lake species. They have very defined, what they call burst speeds or swimming speeds, so we know whether they can get up a one foot drop or whether they can get up a two foot drop, which I'll tell you what, they can't. Um, they're lake species, they're built for slower moving water, so they do want to spawn though, as northern pike will generally do, in moving water systems. And so I provide the best science I can to the Minnehaha Creek staff who then understand that, all right, water's gonna flow downhill and the fish need this level of drop or this maximum amount of velocity at the time that they're gonna be in the creek spawning to be able to migrate through these areas and maybe go from that fishing hole up to an area where they can spawn, procreate and, and create more fish within that system to create better fishing opportunities for the entire system as a whole. So to your point of a binary choice, there is a little bit of, from my perspective, from the science and engineering, a little bit of a choice as, do you want to provide that ecological uplift or not? Because I believe the mayor hit on this with his question as well, is that all those metrics that I provided for stream health, those IBI measurements, those only become improved, or those are only improved upon if you remove the dam. Uh, the stormwater treatment is somewhat a separate element. Yes, we improve water quality a little bit, but all those metrics are based on dam removal and removing that grade and having a, a more naturalized moving water system behind that dam. So and I guess what I'm getting at is there's removal of the dam, but if, if you removed a four-foot dam and put in two two-foot dams, are you still, is that improving it at all or is that still a dam? That's still a dam. In, okay. in this case, it's still a dam because you don't have you know, a, a species that can jump two feet. Got it, okay. <laughs> so then, um, just sticking with you for a second, can. You know, there's a lot of discussion about the fact that not far north of here, we have another big dam. And, and 
so there's, I'm interested in what happens when there's not enough water coming in so that the, nothing's spilling over that dam and consequently not coming into this section of the creek. And then conversely, what happens when, when there's too much water and it's coming in? And, and can you speak a little bit to this, um, the ecological benefits that, you, that you're seeking and how they're affected by that dam that's upstream? Uh, the Browndale Dam, that's, uh, there's really no effect from that. The Grays Bay Dam is the one that has come up in the comments relative to water releases. And that's more of a macro policy question that the district is going to need to look and address potentially long term, whether or not there should be some minimum flows. Because as because a water resource the, practitioner, spigot, right? water is, is the key. If you don't have water, you can't do anything about it. Right. I can, we, we can, as an organization, as a design engineering firm, manage those larger flows that's less of an issue. If you've got a big flood event, you know, the REACH 2022 case in point, we can connect floodplains to streams, we can make sure that they are resilient for these large storm events that we see coming through the cities here on a regular basis now. But when you don't have water, other than me going out there and pumping water out of a well into the stream, there's not a whole lot you can do to save the species that are dependent on water in the creek. So, this may, that may lead to an answer to the, to the other question I have is, if we take this dam out, is there any, what's to prevent, why shouldn't we take out the Browndale Dam? That's above my pay grade. I'll leave that to the district or the city. It was the hardest question for the last. So. <laughs> <laughs> She's not taking the microphone back. No. <laughs> um, well, but to your point about, you're saying Graves Bay Dam is the most important because that's the water that comes this direction, but you know, it's this, it strikes me as the same issue at the mill pond, that if we're, why wouldn't we come back later and say the quality of the water will be improved if we're <coughs> making a move through there more? And that's a more substantial dam than this one yeah. is. We, we see this frequently. We took down a dam called Simpkins Dam on the Patapsco River south of Baltimore about uh, eight years ago. Downstream from Patapsco, uh, from the Simpkins Dam is Bloaty Dam, which is a much larger dam that's closer to where Shad and Herring want to come up from the ocean. And so American Rivers, which was our client at that point with uh, the Maryland DNR, they had an opportunity, much like we see here in Arden, to take down the Simpkins Dam for various reasons. They had some failures. So they took that dam down, knowing full well and good that there's no fish passage in the downstream dam from them. And they just tried to address an opportunity as it arose took down the dam, and then five years later, we took four years to permit the Bloaty Dam, which is the downstream one. That'll be coming out next year, finally. But it's one of those things that we live in that sort of world, and we take the opportunities where they arise. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your you. Uh, patience as I ground through all these issues, and thank you all for your answers. Member Fisher. I feel like Minnehaha Creek, after the spigot's been off, and the stream has dried up of all my questions that I was going to ask. Um, so I do want to thank you. This has been great information. I was at one of the community meetings where, um, where you presented the science, and I will say hearing it a second time makes it easier to understand. I mean, I think you, you, you make it pretty easy to understand, but it's good to hear it a couple times. Um, you know, for me, I, I was out in the park um, on Saturday, and um, there were three girls on tubes. And this is toward the north end of the park, and they were barely moving. And I was on that pedestrian bridge, and a wedding party came up, and they were doing their photography. And as they're trying to set up, here come the tubes really slowly. And now they're in the picture. And I'm hearing the photographer assistant saying, oh my god, it's going to be 45 minutes before they're out of this picture. And, and uh, someone in the wedding party asked the girls, you know, how is it, you know, tubing on the creek here? And the girls, I think, kind of encapsulated all of what we're here about. They said, you know, it's too slow, but I hope they don't take out the waterfall because that's what we're waiting for. And, and I think that's, you know, part of this. And um, so one of, my, one of my questions was, somebody must know how that thing got there to start with. And I'm, I'm hearing that even in this room, nobody seems to know. I've heard some great theories, and I'm, I'm going to stick with the best, the most funny one I heard was that when they built the original um, bridge that they had a bunch of leftover concrete they just pushed it off into the creek and, and, and they just created this iconic community gathering space and I think that's a great story. Um, probably not true but I like it. So uh, a 
just I think most of these have been answered. I think I heard you say that you know, one of the things I've, I've heard so many people talk about is the weeping willows, and we just can't lose those iconic trees. It sounds like we can get into that kind of detail later and figure that out uh, if necessary. One thing that hasn't been addressed, and I've heard as another sort of thing, is the sound, right? We all, um, when you're in that area uh, of where the dam is, uh, you hear the water, and that's as pleasant in some ways as seeing it. And as we look at riffle and, and all of that stuff, is it, I'm assuming it would substantially change sort of that quality of the, the creek. You can't, I don't know what, at what point you have enough sound generated, but I'm guessing it's, you lose it somewhere under two feet. Yeah, Member Fisher, you're, you're absolutely right. We're not gonna recreate that sound. You're gonna have a, a much flatter water system there that even if you have some white water over the top of your riffles, you know, you're not going to recreate the sound of splashing water dropping over a four-foot drop. So, the York correct. So, and, and I'm just going to build on um, Council Member Staunton's point about, uh, I get, you know, that we can't have a four-and-a-half-foot drop because that's actually damming the water up. But I hear we talk about a, a you know, four-and-a-half-foot drop over the course of the whole park. But is it necessarily considered a dam, or could you have have three points where there's you know a more significant drop versus you know the little riffles that just go continuous? I'm just I keep thinking there can, there has to be some solution that's not here or here, and maybe there just isn't. Uh, Member Fisher, that's another good question. Uh, what we look to is essentially what was the system prior to human impact. And there are systems that we have riffle pool structures or drop structures that are naturally of bedrock controlled streams that have small little waterfalls that trickle down mountains. Um, you'll usually find them in mountains. Here in the Midwest, uh, unless you're up in the North Shore, you're generally finding slower meandering streams like Minha Creek and the other areas that just don't naturally have those type of barriers. And that's what, you know, from the science and engineering side, we look at saying, well, those are not natural barriers to the species that are endemic to this creek. And therefore, from a pure science standpoint, we want to eliminate those and try and naturalize that system as best we can to allow that continuity of the system through the park and engage that, that reach with other reaches so that if a fish is stressed somewhere else, they can migrate up through this area here or migrate out, depending on how the climate and water changes impact them. Okay. I think just to expand on your question, you know, how we're taking out four feet of grade and how do we, what's the flexibility and how we make up that grade. And through the design process, that's what we're talking about is flexible where there is a steeper slope, so faster moving water and under different flow conditions, it provides a different level of recreation, putting slope, you know, specifically where that dam is today and then in the northern part of the park um, so there's faster moving water. Um, I think that, you know, the faster moving water in the creek, you know, depending again on the flow is just a, a lot different than water over a dam. Um, we showed you a picture um, early on during the science presentation of a fast moving section of the creek. Um, you know, our staff got to canoe a section of the creek and when you go through some of those sloped areas um, where there's the rock riffles, it is, it is a lot more fun and exciting and it just takes you, takes you through. Um, so those are the kind, that's the kind of flexibility we're talking about, how we place the rocks in the channel that you know, create um, recreation and where that slope in the channel is put, namely the area of the bridge and the northern piece. Um, those are the types of design flexibility things we're talking about versus an actual drop. Okay. Um, this is going to feel a little random, but it's the, the type of, so at that same community meeting, somebody was uh, commenting about their neighbor's bad behavior in terms of the mowing up to the edge of the creek and throwing stuff into the creek and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and what I was surprised to, to hear, and maybe I just misheard, but there really aren't, I know in the, in the design and development community, there are a lot of regulations about building near a, a resource like this. But when you have a home on a creek, are there not rules that you have to follow? I was surprised. Yeah, there's, there's not blanket rules, you know, really about mowing your lawn next to a lake or a creek in the city. 
um, when you develop or redevelop, you build a new home, um, sometimes those rules are triggered um, um, for you know, wetland buffers. But as a general rule, um, there isn't that kind of oversight on private property. Okay, but in our public property, certainly we would, whatever we do with the park, well, the edges of this creek will be very much uh, properly taken care of with the uh, filtering plants and all that, I would assume. Um, I think I understand now, I think we've gone through it enough about, um, you know, this wasn't, you know, number six on the priority scale and now you, you've done five and you're at six. This is all about opportunity. It's about the fact that we as a city want to make some investment in the park. So from a timing perspective, it would make a lot of sense to do it now. And I think I've got that clearly understood. Um, I think the only thing I had left was for you, and and that if I saw the slide correctly, we're probably a million and a half in sort of unfunded dollars that the city would have to come up with if we were to do roughly what's in the concept plan right now. Member Fisher, yes, that is correct. Um, as as we talked about, it's a preliminary budget estimate, and that does include include one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars in contingency. But yes, that is correct. Okay. I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Member Fisher. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about is uh, swimming. Kids enjoy swimming down on the south side of the of the bridge right now. How does uh, the proposed re-meander affect uh, those little swimming holes or swimming locations? Do we reduce them, eliminate them, enhance them? What, what are your thoughts there? Mayor, it's an excellent question. So downstream from the bridge, that swimming hole will remain in place. As Renee indicated, the geometry of the bridge opening is what kind of pushes the water through in like a kind of fire hose jet when the water's really running there. That's what scours out the hole and maintains the depth of that fishing hole just downstream from the bridge. That'll be maintained. As you've noticed, there's an eddy there that keeps eroding out to the side. We'd want to stabilize that and provide more stable bank there for both fishermen as well as swimming access so that you've got more defined bank that's not going to be continued to erode towards that, that west side. Throughout the park, you'll have more swimming opportunities as well. I mean, the tubers won't be waiting 45 minutes to hit something exciting. We'll have those riffles throughout the park. And so you will have an opportunity for people to get out of the tubes, maybe jump into a slightly deeper pool. We could put in, you know, four or five foot deep pools throughout the park as they come off the riffle structures. So you'll have more opportunities. And if we can keep cleaning up the, the water throughout the system, Obviously, it's going to be more uh, attractive to swim in as we continue working on the creek. Mm -hmm. um, one day I was over at, I uh, see Mr. Hartman in the audience here. He, uh, uh, he lives right up at the top of Woodcrest on the first house, and we go down in his patio system. He's got a beautiful view of the bridge and then that kind of rushing water uh, under the bridge triggered by the four foot drop and then. I suppose depending on which water is coming to the creek at that particular time. And then you, you get that aesthetic effect that Member Fisher talked about of both sound and sight. You get the, the riffle sort of effect uh, amplified, but there was a beautiful rushing sound of water too. So what, what I just heard you say was that as the water compresses uh, in the creek bed and, and passes through that more narrow opening under the bridge, you're really going to have are, is there still going to be some uh, some sound to it? You're going to be this, there's going to be a sight from the ripple effect, but what about that sound? It, it'll be gone. Yeah, that, it'll be that gone. mayor will be that'll be gone because a lot of that sound is generated by that four foot drop. In my opinion, that we're going to have a lot less sound there once you eliminate okay. that. And that's created by the effect of the of the, of the damming. Uh, Correct. Right there. So. Um, when Renee Clark was talking a minute or so ago, and this was an answer, an answer she gave in conjunction with both uh, questions from Member Staunton and Member Fisher, it caused me to think about this four-foot drop. And now we've got a, we actually got a you know concrete barrier there that acts as a dam. Uh, and when you think about what you're contemplating in terms of fish going upstream to spawn and what their abilities are to climb, uh, could they climb? something that was more like a hill than, a, than tried to get around a dam? Or what are their abilities? Uh, you know, this goes to this whole issue of can we find some kind of happy medium here that, that still accomplishes what we want to do uh, with respect to all the science that you're talking about, but still maintain some of these qualities of the dam without having the dam there? 
Uh, Another mayor, way to ask the question, I guess. Uh, the, the, the question, Mayor, is probably better served to be asked of one of my fish biologists versus myself as an engineer. But um, speaking generally, you know, the uh, passage around a dam is, is challenging at best. Um, the species that we have here in the Midwest are just not built for moving past dams. And so you inherently are creating any, a, a barrier to that connectivity of your river system, or in this case, a stream system, if you leave any sort of dam in place, even if it's a small drop. So um, we, I, the fish bio could give you the exact details on how fast the velocity can be at the time that they want to be traversing that area for spawning. And that's the science that we can then bring to the district to say, you know, during March, we need to have this velocity of water, which limits our slope to this percentage based on the northern pike spawning here. But um, you, you typically, in Midwest streams, you're looking at very low gradient systems. I mean, Hot Creek is typical of that, where you just mm -hmm. don't have natural dams in those systems, with the exception of Minaha Falls, which is obviously a barrier between this and the Mississippi. So what's the proposal on how to deal with that four, four and a half foot drop over the expanse of the park to be able to allow fish to get upstream to spawn? So what we do is we spread that, that, that drop across the entire meander. So we take that four feet and we spread that in discrete areas, mind you, over these riffle segments. Um, throughout that 2,000 feet of meandered creek channel. So you might, at the north end of the park, then have about a you know, 20 to 30 foot stretch of rockier area that's moving faster that then tails out into a pool, goes into another rockier area. And to Renee's point, what we do is we look at some of the recreational amenities that we want to preserve. And especially if you have tubing, you want to make sure you've got egress uh, access to the creek in areas that are not moving very quickly. So we design riffles so that you know your young tuber six-year-old trying to make his way out of the uh, creek at the right location has a very quiescent pool to exit from versus a riffle and so we'll, that's where we start getting into the final design details of how to spread that grade out across mm -hmm. those 2,000 linear feet at locations that it makes sense from a recreational standpoint as well as from an ecological standpoint okay good bear with me just a moment here mr. mayor while you're looking yes, can yeah. i ask member you a so, I thought I saw your hand go it, up. There. Yeah. Mm. It, uh, it, it reminded me of something, uh, an email I got, um, or two maybe, where people have referenced that we're, we're working so hard in this concept to help fish move a little further up the creek. Um, and then they showed pictures of a whole lot of dead fish, like uh, winter kill. And, and the reference, I believe, was, um, you know, if, if there's not enough water coming from, you know, Lake Minnetonka, the fish are dying. So what are we accomplishing? And, and what, can you talk a little bit about the sun? What, what happens when you get a winter kill like that um, next spring? I mean, how does that whole cycle work? And, and how would this change any of that or, or, or help it? Would you like me to address that, Renee, or would you like to? All right, Member Fisher, that's a great question. Again, that's part of that holistic issue that we've got with the creek. Um, we as river restoration practitioners are advocates for maintaining some sort of base flow year round. Uh, that goes to the policies that were um, developed around how Grays Bay Dam operates. And so we would encourage, especially the residents here that are concerned about that, to weigh into that process as that policy is, is rethought and reevaluated in association with the district and the Corps of Engineers. Uh, this particular project relative to that element will frankly not provide a lot of difference. When you don't have water, you don't have water. The depth of the pools that we're going to create are likely not going to be deep enough to provide overwintering if you get a super hard freeze and there's not enough water in the creek. Flat out, it's just not going to work. And so what we are providing, though, is, again, a, a benefit to the creek that over the long term, if we do start establishing those flows that allow fish to overwinter, that you get that year-over-year -year sustained life there. Right now, if you do have a serious winter kill in any portion of the creek, you're essentially looking for repositories of that biological life to make its way back downstream. So they're coming either down from the lake systems or from the deeper fishing holes like below the 54th Street Bridge there that happened to occur for various reasons along the corridor that repopulate those areas then. So taking down the dam may allow actually more effective repopulation of the creek upstream by allowing that passage beyond the current barrier that's there. Okay, thank you. Right. I have no further questions. Does that prompt anything from anyone else? Number A couple of quick ones. Um, so on the, on the ecology, you gave us a lot of great data and measurements and metrics. Do you have um, an opinion about the trajectory 
So if we don't do something, is it headed in a certain direction, and what is that? What is that future like if we don't take in, if we don't make an intervention here? Uh, Member Stoughton, that's, uh, I appreciate your question. The current creek behind the dam is is impaired. It's uh, it's a it's an impaired and uh, a very impacted system that will continue to degrade as we leave that dam in place. So you're going to have more sediment fill in there and you'll have essentially um, already fairly shallow water levels through there so that the oxygen will diminish uh, because of the biological activity going on in that sediment. That uh, sediment that flows in there is captured, covers all those aquatic plants, that'll continue to happen. So the trajectory I think has, because of the age of this dam, is fairly well plateaued uh, in terms of how diminished the biological activity is behind the dam. This is a, a long-standing dam, but um, it's, it's on a slow decline. They'll continue because of the way that dam uh, manages the water there. Renee? I think just to expand on that, um, the, the, it's not maybe so much of what happens tomorrow, or you know, if you don't do it, it's um, foregoing the opportunity, I guess, okay. to achieve those benefits. The creek, um, you know, system-wide has um, issues from urban runoff, the channel's been ditched and straightened and dammed, and the corridor has been fragmented. So it's a, you know, there's um, issue with water um, quantity flow has come up a lot. Um, there's flooding issues. There's stormwater runoff and flashy flow issues that cause erosion. Um, the Grays Bay Dam, that's how the watershed district came to be because of flooding in the winter downstream in Edina and Minneapolis um, from ice dams. Um, so to control that winter flow, um, that was kind of the, um, one of the initial things. How that is managed has been um, under discussion. We've studied base flow in the creek, how um, you know, the contribution of lake flow to groundwater inputs and where can you recharge base flow. Um, so we, we know a lot about the system and all these opportunities in these focused larger um, regional areas and these opportunities like Arden Park are a piece of this larger puzzle that you know, we have the opportunity to put in today. Um, and um, that's, that's the trade-off, you know, sure. really. Yeah. Um, that'll be my next archaeological dig is the history <laughs> on Grays Bay Dam. Um, uh, one last question, just, and in, maybe it's Ms. Catre or you or both. Um, in terms of the money, I understand we've got this kind of two-stage process where we have to decide whether we want to go ahead, and then we've got a period of design, and then, and then there's a final decision about are you going to go ahead. Can you give me any sense of the percentage of dollars we're talking about out of the whole project that are spent during the design phase versus during the implementation phase? It's about the design um, dollars are approximately 10% of the total project estimate. Um, though there's, um, yeah, it, it's just a little over 10% of that total project estimate. Okay. Um, getting to the first review spends about 40% um, of those um, phase one design dollars um, to achieve okay. that level of, okay. of detail. And the same for the city? The, uh, the city expenditure for design in the first year is uh, about $274,000. Okay. That's right. if we go through the entire design process in 2018. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Member Brindle. Thank you. As we're talking about meandering the creek, it occurs to me that um, we have spoken about meandering, re-meandering Nine Mile Creek early in my first term as a council member, the Nine Mile Creek Regional Trail was being discussed with Three Rivers Park District and a very similar discussion about Nine Mile Creek, which had been straightened in order for backyards to be uniform um, was discussed and the rushing water in the creek causing erosion, 
the stormwater um, being, uh, being washed into the creek, the salt being washed into the creek. Um, so in looking at a project or in looking for a project that, um, that has had some similar goals, it's a different project, but had similar goals, um, that project is complete. And so it would, I think it would be a good exercise to take a look at kind of some befores and afters and see how, see what the success is uh, and talk to some of the residents in that area. Some of those residents have actually weighed in on this project and talked about how concerned they were about the project going into it and how successful it is at this point and how much they like it. So um, just, just as a perspective uh, for looking at a project that did try to accomplish some of these same things, we actually do have something we can look at our, in our own community. Thank you. <coughs> Member Stewart. Thank you. Uh, the, the science on this is uh, far more complex when you dig into it than, than it appears at first blush, and I appreciate you uh, helping us dig into that. Um, I wanted to ask Mr. Cusa, one of the issues that you mentioned in your original comments, uh, and we haven't revisited that, was uh, water temperature. Does, does this project uh, do anything that affects water temperature? Does it, does it change it in some parts or homogenize it, or what, and, and do we care? Uh, Member Stewart, thank you for your question. The, we do care is the first answer. Uh, in all cases, we want to, um, as best as we can, keep water temperatures low. Fish generally um, don't like high water temperatures. Uh, this project will, over the short term, have a very marginal impact on water temperature by the removal of the dam within the first phase. But again, that riparian corridor, trying to get all those trees planted through there, um, that will, over the long term, help reduce the amount of sunlight impacting that water directly. You know, right now, if you go out there, it's got a very dark bottom from all that silt that's in there. That obviously sucks in a lot of the heat from the sun, heats the water up, sends that downstream. Over a 10 to 20 year period, you might see a discernible difference in water temperature. You know, frankly, given the size of this dam, it's a relatively small dam. The difference currently between the upstream and downstream water temperature is not going to change marginally with or without the dam year one after the dam's removed. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I thank all of you. I think my colleagues have been uh, very complimentary to the presentation and justifiably so. This is very helpful. Thanks to all of you. All right, the uh, next matter we have in front of us in this portion of the agenda is the uh, request for purchase for contracting services, and Director Teague has this matter. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Before you, uh, we have two contracts that would help us complete the Greater Southdale Area Start Study as part of the comprehensive plan. The contracts are for AFO, um, Architecture Field Office, which is Mick Johnson, and Beco Associates, the primary consultant for the larger comprehensive plan, and the main contact uh, on, on this study would be Dan Cornejo. Um, Michael Schroeder is here, the co-chair of the uh, Greater Southdale Area Work Group to present the work group framework. Also, before Michael begins, I do want to point out that um, in your packet is a list of names that are recommended for the work group. Uh, two names I want to highlight. It's, a, it's the same work group that, um, that uh, did the work in phase two with two changes. Uh, Claudia Carr is no longer on the Planning Commission, so we're recommending a replacement from the Planning Commission, John Hamilton, to fill that seat. And um, Rob Grumman, who was a representative from the hospital, is no longer on the work group. And we're recommending uh, Amy Wimmer. And she is a resident of Edina. She uh, is a project manager for Heinz, and one of those properties is the Galleria. So it would be an excellent replacement for Mr. Grumman. So we're recommending that the council approve those names uh, to serve on the work group this evening. And with that, I will introduce Michael Schroeder to pre present the, uh, the, the work group framework. framework. Right, thank you. I'd also note that um, Jim Nelson, one of the members of the uh, advisory group, took the time to write about Ms. Wimmer 
and I appreciate that as well, Mr. Nelson. Thank you. Very helpful. All right, Mr. Schroeder, good, nice to see you. Mayor, um, I'm, I don't know how to get um, my presentation up here, and I will do my utmost to try and keep this item shorter than the last one. We'll help you <laughs> if you falter. Uh, Mayor and council members, this is the essential of the list uh, that we have in our work group composition going forward. And uh, it just as Director Teague noted, we have the two replacements. Um, we've, John Hamilton has actually been participating in a couple of work group meetings uh, to date and we're excited by the prospect of having uh, Amy Wimmer uh, join us. So you note that she's identified under the city council appointments. Um, I wanted to talk about this from the perspective of outcomes. I'll talk about process and schedule and then some of the things that we need to do as a work group to try and get this um, laid out. When we talk about this, it, it's important to recognize that we're heading toward a, a alignment with the city's comprehensive plan, that evolution, and we've talked a lot about that. The last time I was in front of this group, I talked about that. So a, a key deliverable is this aspirational plan that aligns with, with the requirements of the comprehensive plan. We also are looking for ways to highlight uh, innovation and invention in the same way that maybe Southdale and Centennial Lakes have led uh, to a sense of innovation and invention for, uh, for this district and for the community. We recognize that we have to find a way to bring voices from the community into our process, and uh, we also want to make certain that the leadership of uh, the plan comes from representatives of the community as, as embodied um, by the work group. We talk about the kinds of meetings that we, we intend to have. Um, the work group, as we get into this, you'll see, has really committed to a significant number of meetings. We'll have open house meetings, um, which are our chance to interface with the community, and then update meetings where we'll come back to the, the planning commission in particular to coordinate aspects of the comprehensive plan, and then as needed with the city council. Um, I, I just want to highlight one thing under methods, because this is really core to how the work group functioned in our first stage. Um, the dialogue that we have was really important for us moving through the first stage and coming up with a set of working principles. Um, we're looking forward to that dialogue being perpetuated in what we call stage three or four, really um, as we move towards the, the work plan. Um, when we talk about the process we're following, we really see it divided into three stages. The first stage is that intensive dialogue which um, as you'll see in the schedule, will happen over probably eight or nine meetings. And it's really a phase of continuing to learn about what we can do to shape the evolution of the Southdale area. Um, the second is creating um, the guidance that we need to actually um, direct the evolution. And the third stage is documenting it in a plan. Um, you'll see on the right side of this screen, the, the kind of the general topics that the work group would be having in our, in what we're framing as dialogues. And they're, they're very much the same as what we talked about the last time we were here. They're higher, higher order ideas, and from that we would be extracting the principles that would guide the evolution. This is important when we look at the schedule. Um, we have highlighted here three, time, three kinds of meetings. We have work group meetings, and this is where we would work with our consulting team, and we would ask that they be, um, that they would help us as guides through these issues, and as provokers of deep questions. Um, we have lots of questions on our own. We're hoping that the consultant team, um, as, they, as they're brought into our process, can help us think even deeper about the, the things that we need to be considering to move this forward. We've also identified at, at key points in this process um, what we're calling work group sessions. And this is where we would be working apart from the consultants. We don't need the consultants at every meeting. We believe there are times when we actually need to accomplish some work on our own to further some dialogue on our own and figure out how we, how we provoke the consultants to the next level of understanding of, of the Southdale District. And you'll see that we have a, a series of open houses as well, which we kind of characterize as semi-formal opportunities for exchange. And I characterize it as semi-informal because we're just residents we want to have dialogues with neighbors as we bring these things forward. And as we frame the process for how we move through the, those uh, um, open house sessions, we really believe it's important for us as a work group 
to be prominent in the presentations and not to be relying solely on consultants to make presentations. You can see that we've organized this across a series of months that tries to deliver in the last boxes on the lower right corner of the screen um, the, the notion that it's coming to the Planning Commission hearing and City Council hearings in June and July of 2018. We know there's a series of refinements going from what you have in front of you with the AFO and the BICO um, c consulting contracts. And I want to spend a little more time on this slide in particular. Um, as we go through this, and as, as I note in the resolution portion, um, we're willing to sit with staff and with the consulting team to make sure that those uh, refinements focus on a scope that works with how we've been working through this process. Um, and also to make certain that we can align that scope to the process that delivers the comprehensive plan component um, in June and July of next year. We need to make certain that the expertise that we're bringing into this is well aligned with what's really needed for the South Dale area. Um, and so we have benefited significantly in stage two from Mick Johnson's um, assistance in crafting a framework. What we really need now is the help in guiding through the policy questions that will support that framework. We want to make certain that the, that the consultants are understood to support our efforts as residents of, of the Edina community and not have consultants directing the operations or the activities of the work group. We want to focus on interactions with the community through the work group, not with the consultants being the interactors. Um, we want to orchestrate meetings that allow for intensive dialogues not presentations, not lectures. Um, we have, as, as we learned in the first phase, we had 12 people in the first phase. We had 12 really good people with really good thoughts coming together. We want to make certain that that process is prominent as we move into these next stages. Um, we think, I'm, I'm kind of down to number six now, um, we want to allow the meetings and even the number of meetings to be somewhat organic. Um, we know that as we move through this process that there's a contractual side to this and that our consultants will want to know how many meetings they have to attend. From our perspective, we're learning still. We're moving through a process of guiding the development of 700 acres of developed land in the, in the community. For us, it's important to allow ourselves the latitude to add a meeting if we need it or two meetings. Um, and then the, the last point, number seven, is our opportunity to step aside from the consultant process from time to time to make certain that we're sticking with the big goals of delivering uh, a, a, a plan that allows for a significant evolution over time of the South Dell area. So I'll stop. Thanks again for your work. Um, it is a reminder and others who are in the audience of uh, two years, over two years of work on this. And um, it's been terrific work. And, and I'm, uh, I'm really pleased with the composition of the group that you've put together. It's a terrific group of people. And looking forward to Ms. Wimmers being part of that group, too. I do note that. I think every member is a resident of Edina with the exception of one who is just temporarily away from the city and sh I'm sure she will return once, uh, once you do the good work that makes our community a better place in the future. Um, and I want to underscore some of the points that you talked about in terms of this being resident led. I mean that we've got members of our community who are really leading this and I've, I've been, the council has heard me talk about this with other entities as well. When we had our joint meeting with the um, Planning Commission in a work session, I've talked about this with the two Planning Commission members who are co-chairs of the 44th in France uh, small area plan. It's really important that this be resident-led, that these are, you know, members of our community. And it's great to have the assistance and expertise of staff, and it's great to have um, really talented consultants available, but they should be there to assist us as we figure out the right path forward and to ask the right questions if we're not thinking about them. So, um, so I'm pleased to hear that. Um, in terms of this um, moving from stage two to stage three and four, I'm, I'm wrestling a little bit with envisioning 
how we get from the principles which have been really valuable and this set of um, kind of graphics of the greater Southdale area that were produced by phase two and how we merge that into a comprehensive planning process that is underway and we're working on a variety of small area plans. But ultimately, we want to have a product here that can be part of our comprehensive plan and give folks in the community and people who want to invest in our community the clear understanding of the direction that we want things to go in this area. And I'm, I'm wondering if your group has given thought to that and, and then how, whether we've really thought through the two consulting contracts supporting that, or do you need more time to think through that before we decide on exactly what we need in terms of consulting resources? Member Staunton, I think I would suggest, as I was getting in my last slide, we do need more time to actually get through that. And I think the, the critical thing for us is to recognize where the line falls between policy definition and specification. So as we've been working towards this, we've been trying to frame policy that can be aligned with the comprehensive plan, that becomes a really important tool for, for, for all of us to look forward to um, as the Southdale area evolves. We want to stay away from specification because we don't know and we can't get to every answer um, for this district within the next 12 months or nine months, however long this process moves, moves us through. And, and in fact, that would be the next logical step after the comprehensive plan would be to develop zoning regulations Correct. that implement those goals. Correct. I, I would point out, though, that one of the things that we really, as a work group, we've recognized as we move through stage one and also through st stage two, that we have avoided looking at absolutes relative to height, density, right. or intensity. And even as we've gone through that, we have challenged ourselves and this might be the invention part of what I talked about. Are there other models that we could pursue that would help us understand um, development factors from a perspective of experience? Because when we talk um, about the, the future of the South Hill area, we get excited about what it's like to be there. And those things aren't easily translated into heights as stories or intensity as FAR. So if we can figure out other metrics that get us to the kind of quality experience <coughs> for, that we're envisioning and that are that we're being shaped by the sketches and the diagramming that AFO did in stage two. That's an important outcome for us. But that that too is framing regulatory parameters and maybe starting to nail down different methods of achieving regulatory parameters. We may not succeed in coming up with something that's better than height density and FAR, but I'd like to think we should be exploring it here. So as you know, we've got these two proposals, um, and I and I think they both responded to our request to provide us something because um, Mick Johnson and his team have done great work for us in the second phase, and obviously, Biko is helping us with the comprehensive plan. So they're two logical parties for us to be partnering with as we move forward. But I, I, it, it almost feels to me like it's a little premature to to um, kind of sign off on, on this before we know more about the direction that we're going? Member Sutton, that, uh, I think that aligns with what I'm thinking, and I think the work group would agree with me. Um, so I, I wonder, um, Mr. Mayor, if we might want to give the work group some time and maybe it's with the, the BICO and Associates group that's leading the comprehensive plan to try to figure out what the resources are within this scope. I think this has set a nice um, outer edges of what we might need, but there might be some repositioning. Um, and, I, and I appreciate the fact that when we ask somebody for a proposal, they want to put out specific structure to what they're doing and they're and we're they're asking for some money and we and we want to know what they're going to do but it feels like we're a little ahead of where you might be as a group uh, i think we're we would agree so director t um 
you know, it's the Planning Commission that's recommended to the city continue uh, the relationship at this point in time. So what, what are your thoughts or could you express to the council on behalf of the Planning Commission why they thought these two notions were aligned at this point in time? Yeah, and I think part of that direction was from the city council when, when AFO presented the phase two of that framework. The thought was we will continue that relationship with AFO as we move into the comprehensive plan. So it's, it's kind of a combination of the both. But I think we can, we can take these two contracts, sit down with the working group, and, and come back to the council either at your next meeting or maybe it's going to take a month. Whatever it takes to um, get all those, get the work group aligned with the contracts and, and bring it back before the council. Yeah, and I want to be clear. I, I mean, it's very logical how we got here. It's just as I was looking at it and trying in my own mind to think about how we how we can bridge this. This next step is going to be challenging because there's been a lot of good big picture thinking, but how do we convert that into something that's really useful in a comprehensive plan? And I just want the group to be able to think through that with you, Carrie, and then with um, with the folks who are helping us with the comprehensive plan before kind of dialing in a specific um, consulting team. That would be, mm -hmm. so I guess, Mr. Mayor, what I'd recommend is that we, um, we approve the composition of the group um, I know Ms. Wimmers is an addition. I don't know whether our last time around we have, I think we authorized moving forward, but maybe not a specific group. Um, and then we just continue until a future meeting, um, a more detailed discussion of what consulting resources we should engage to support them. Mr. Schroeder, does deferring a decision on the consulting contracts put you off your timetable that you showed us? It looked like there was a lot there. Uh, Member Stewart, um, if I fall back on my previous experience as a consultant, if a client tells me I have 10 months to do the work, I'll find a way to do the work in 10 months. So would part of the next process be, and I guess I had assumed that, that this had come through your working group, that the scope of work for the architectural field office and BICO had been basically defined by your group, but that's not what I'm hearing. It, uh, Mayor, I would say it's been framed, and I think Kevin Staunton put it correctly. We have a frame for how it works. It's really the details, and, and it comes down to a bit of trying to say that, as I was talking about the comprehensive plan being a fine line between policy and specifications, even the work plan of how we move through this process will fall between somewhere between this organic notion of how the work group would want to proceed through it and specification related to a contract. And I think as we have looked at this more closely and understood how we would be coming together as a work group, um, I think there's still more work we need to do to get that tied down. All right. Council members comfortable with this approach? Yes. All right, so I'll entertain a motion to add uh, Amy Wimmer and John Hamilton to the South Dell Area Work Group uh, and maintain the, the other existing membership that's defined in the, um, in the memo from Director Teague. So moved. Second. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And then um, we'll leave it up to your group to, uh, I guess, suggest to staff when it come back to us for approval on the contracts. We will do that later. All right, good. Thanks for that inquiry. Thanks for... Member Stanton for drilling down that a little bit deeper. All right. Um, next, we have the final uh, item in the reports and recommendations portion of the agenda, and that's approving grants and donations. It is embodied in Resolution 2017-78. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution? So moved. Second. And a motion second to accept the donations on behalf of the City of Edina embodied in Resolution 2017-78. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Carried. Uh, we've got some cash and in-kind contributions uh, related to Park and Rec and the Arts Center and those donors' names uh, will be on the website. Thank you. Correspondence petitions. 
Anything other than what uh, we've had on the dais this evening? No, no there is not. Okay, good. Aviation noise update, member Brindle, anything there? I do have a couple of things. Uh, we had a meeting on July 19th, which was right after our previous council meeting. Um, let's see, there were the typical technical reports. Uh, they are continuing to try to make their technical information easier to read and more interactive. Um, so uh, if, if people go out to the noise, it's uh, macnoise.com, and they see something in there they don't quite understand, they can send an email, they can contact me, uh, but, um, but they are continuing to, to make some of those tools more interactive and more uh, understandable. Um, we heard a detailed report on Super Bowl preparations. The airport is going to be very important uh, in getting people in and out uh, in the weeks uh, prior to the Super Bowl. It's expected that beginning at about halftime, people will start flying out of here on Super Bowl Sunday. They don't even stay for the whole game. They've been here <laughs> the week before promoting whatever they're promoting and having their tent where to, wherever it is. And once the Super Bowl gets underway, then they move on. So yeah, party's over. But the, uh, the airport effort includes all the airports in Minnesota. There are gonna be so many jets coming in here that they're gonna need parking space for all these jets. And so some of them will park locally, some of them will park outstate, Rochester, Duluth, St. Cloud. Uh, so it's, it's gonna be pretty interesting to see how all this, all this coordination effort goes. Um, they've got a terrific committee that sound, they, they sound very organized. Um, there was a Star Tribune article about this, and uh, so if people are curious about what's being done, uh, they can search the Star Tribune and look for the article about the Super Bowl preparations. Volunteers are needed. Uh, you can go to mnsuperbowl.com if you would like to volunteer at the airport to be a greeter, uh, part of the host committee, part of friends and family charters, uh, there are a variety of volunteer positions. When people arrive for the Super Bowl at the airport, uh, the airport wants to have it obvious that Minneapolis welcomes them, Minnesota welcomes them to the Super Bowl, wants to make them, uh, give them hospitality, and so those volunteer opportunities are there. Um, and we are getting noise complaints. There are airplanes flying over Edina with pretty, uh, at a pretty regular pace. Um, that wasn't true a couple of months ago. It was pretty quiet here. And uh, we weren't getting a lot of complaints. So I've asked for a progress report on runway use program, which is uh, an effort to kind of move airport noise around equally among the communities. So, um, so we'll see how, it, how we're doing with that. The run, when, runway use program, we talked about it several months ago and we haven't talked about it at all in our, in our meetings of late. So, um, so wanting to right. just check on how that's going. Uh, let's see here. And at this last meeting, there was a pretty serious discussion about how it is that the noise committee got formed in the first place. And it's really a, providing the MAC the opportunity to outreach to cities and that are affected by airport noise. And, um, and some cities are thinking that uh, we need to go back to why the NOC was formed and kind of look at it with, uh, with a closer eye to whether the cities are getting the, the representation and the um, and the ear that they expect to have on the NAC. So the, the, the uh, conversation is intensifying a little bit. So I expect we'll have a meaningful discussion even, even between meetings. Edina is part of an at-large seat. We don't have our own seat. So um, one, of the, one of the calls for um, communication that, that I've asked for and will continue to ask for is for the members in that at-large seat to talk together 
and just kind of compare notes so that our representative who's on the knock is Tom Link from Invergrove Heights can carry our message to to the dais. So that's my report. Good. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, any questions for Member Brindle? Otherwise, we'll go to Council Comments and Member Fisher. All right. A uh, couple things I'll talk about tonight are the, just an update on the sun current um, mm. distribution. So it, I, think our, um, I think at our last meeting, um, I was surprised to hear that people living in certain zip codes that cross our city border into our neighboring cities would not be able to get the sun current mailed to them. I talked to Craig Anderson uh, who is a person I've been talking to at ECM Publications, and he did not believe that to be the case um, in all of the discussions they've had at the Sun Current. So, um, well, um, so I'm getting conflicting opinions, and he gave me another person to talk to, and I'll, that'll be my next step is to, uh, from his perspective, that shouldn't be. Um, that they've been tweaking it, that maybe out of the shoots there were some issues, but um, so I'll try and get on that. The, the, regardless, on September 14th, that edition will be in the mail. There will not be a carrier bringing it to anybody's door on September 14th. So that's the, the crossover date. Um, the format will change slightly, um, probably not dramatically. And then, of course, there's still online. There's still the newsstands that we can affect and, and still pick out new or different locations if we want. So anyway, I just wanted to let <clears throat> folks know that they should still be trying to sign up. We should still be doing everything we can to get the word out through whatever channels of communication we have. Um, and then the other thing I brought up at the last meeting was uh, where um, our city attorney just ruined my whole party on a <laughs> I'm just kidding, on the... Uh, you know, what can we do on, in terms of licensing um, contractors that are doing these teardowns in our community? And we, I get it, we can't do that, but I'll tell you what, I've gotten a lot of creative ideas from folks that either heard that. So amazingly, actually people stick around and listen to this portion of our meeting. This is one thing I learned. And, uh, but at, at last night at Night to Unite, I got some more good ideas and um, I'll be chatting with our city attorney and staff and seeing if we can't, uh, work another plan to uh, to enforce better performance on, on our next generation of housing. So that's all I have. Thank you. Member Stott. Uh Just a couple of quick things. Um, updating on my League of Minnesota Cities um, board activities. We uh, The League has already started its legislative uh, policy making process for next year, believe it or not, when we're in just at the end of July. So I participated in our um, Improving Local Economies um, discussion. It's a group of city officials from, uh, there's probably 35 or 40 folks who are in this committee and they do a great job. There's three different committees and do a great job of, of kind of gathering ideas and it's the process that leads ultimately to the positions that the league takes on legislative issues and an important process. So I'll keep you up to date as that moves along. Um, and then the only other thing that I wanted to mention was picking up on the community comment from earlier, the couple of residents who expressed concern about the terms of the conditional use permit at the school project. Um, I just want to make sure we're following up in some way to engage with um, staff at the school district. I do remember them coming forward during that process and there were a lot of assurances made so I, you know, we ought to make sure that that folks are living up to them. And that's all I have, Mr. Moran. Good, thank you. Member Brindle. I have a couple things. First of all, uh, thank you to the Edina Police Department. I uh, rode along with Officer Joe Delgahausen. All right. Cool. His name is so long. I mean, it goes beyond his pocket. <laughs> uh, but um, he actually picked me up at our neighborhood block party and um, and then we went to three more parties after that in in the southwest corner of Edina where we are and it was it was terrific we had some great conversations a lot of fun and uh, thanks to uh, residents 
throughout the community for your hospitality and hosting block parties for your for your neighbors and uh, in particularly for welcoming uh, police officers and uh, and city council members to step into your parties and and have conversations. It's very meaningful. Um, I in the last couple of weeks have attended two legislative updates. Uh, one was um, hosted by the Coalition of Asian Americans, uh, where House and Senate members talked about employment and uh, grant opportunities for um, Asian Americans as it relates to employment and, um, and improving their um, economic and, uh, and, and just uh, being able to live comfortably in the, in the Twin Cities and, uh, and access to jobs, access to essential resources. So it was very interesting. And then also then attended an evening um, town hall uh, legislative update with Senator Melissa Franzen and House of Representatives uh, Paul Rosenthal and Dar Dario Anselmo. So thank you to, uh, to everyone involved in both of those both of those sessions for taking your time to um, to connect with everybody. Um, been getting like daily uh, complaints and inquiries about the service line warranty letter that went out, and um, and there are some very succinct questions being asked, and so there are there are some resources. Uh, online about the service line warranty program and uh, talks about a typical liability, talks about the cost of the program. And, uh, but some of the, uh, some of the questioners are, are wondering uh, about what's the likelihood that I'm gonna have a problem and a little more detail behind that. So I know I've been kind of passing that on to manager Neil and he's been helpful as well. So I thought I'd ask you to comment on that, if you would, please. Sure. Uh, we have, uh, in fact, just today, uh, staff led by uh, Ms. Benarat met with uh, representatives from the service line uh, warranty group. Uh, we are going to change the way that uh, the communication goes uh, to residents this time. Uh, we are answering the same kind of questions, I think, that all of you are getting. Um, but they are getting a number of people that are interested in this policy. But it, it, is, it is, from our standpoint, something uh, that we can't, we can't uh, really give them much help in judging the level of risk or vulnerability of their, syst of their own uh, plumbing. They're probably best to hire a plumber to do that or to get some feedback uh, from perhaps our building inspections group about how old their plumbing might be, if we know that at all. But it's, uh, it's something from a, from a public standpoint. Um, some of the questions that, that we've answered were, why are we doing it? What do we have? Uh, do, we get a, do we have a stake in somebody's personal plumbing? Not so much, uh, other than we do see people that uh, experience a great deal of fiscal and just emotional pain when we can't help them with, with uh, something that's happened to their water line or their sewer line. And that's where the motivation came from to uh, at least uh, bring this program to their, intention, their attention. But we have a, a, a much better plan in place to communicate this uh, next time, both what it is, how it came to be, and uh, at least some of the advice that we can give to people about, about that subject matter. All right, thank you. Uh, lastly, um, KBOC is uh, a wonderful, resident, longtime volunteer, garden council, garden club member, Annie Dinah. She was part of planning the Edina Centennial um, in 1988. And um, her husband, Ron, passed away recently. And so I went to the funeral, but um, just to convey our um, condolences to Kay and her family. Yeah, thank you. Didn't know about that. Good. Member Stewart. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to report that the Edina East uh, High School class of 1977 had a, a very successful reunion on July 22nd. Uh, great fun to see 
It was 40 years ago, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Do you know anybody from that class? <laughs> but it's all good. It's all good. Um, so uh, on Tuesday, July 25th, we had two meetings. Uh, first uh, meeting to talk about the possibility of having rail, uh, some passenger rail on the Dan Patch line that goes through Edina. Um, that was a, a lively meeting. Uh, I could only stay for most of the first hour because then I uh, bailed out to come here for the uh, town hall meeting legislative update that uh, Member Brindle talked about with uh, Senator Franzen and, and representatives Anselmo and Rosenthal. Um, also, uh, I got to ride along on a night to unite. Uh, I want to thank the police department for uh, enabling that to happen. Uh, Brian Hubbard uh, in, at the police department did a great job of organizing the whole evening. Uh, I understood that we had 93 uh, different parties that had asked for um, uh, visits from the police department, and they, he had all of those scheduled. Uh, then I understand there were three more that happened the day of the event, uh, and I think he even tried to get those worked in as well. Um, it, but uh, I got to ride along with Officer Keith Berger, uh, and then uh, uh, Reserve Officer Steve Clark, and uh, Dispatcher Katie uh, Danielson. Uh, just a great group of uh, people who serve our community, and uh, it was really a good evening to be with them. We visited seven different parties, and I got to see a lot of great people, so thank you for that. Um, as we look ahead here, tomorrow is the grand opening for 66 West. Uh, that event is from 5 to 8 uh, at the 66 West location. There will be a program at 530. Um, on, uh, on August the 10th, a week from tomorrow, uh, we're going to have a chance to uh, tour the city's infrastructure. And so we're looking forward to that as well. Um, I'll mention that on Monday, August 14th coming up, uh, our uh, Human Rights and Relations Commission is hosting an event uh, focusing on immigration. And that'll be at the Hughes Pavilion at Centennial Lakes at 7 o'clock p.m on Monday, August 14th. Um, a couple things just to follow up. The, uh, I, in this round with this uh, service warranty program, uh, people can expect to receive more letters, right? We, aren't there right. a couple rounds of communications? Yep. Uh, but the, the uh, city will take a more active role in helping to uh, prepare those communications so that they aren't quite so uh, surprising. That's right, and that process has already started, <laughs> right. as I said, started right. today, actually. And then finally, um, uh, Member Brindle talking about the Super Bowl coming up reminded me that uh, we had talked about uh, Airbnb here in Edina. I had been told that doing nothing, that Airbnb rentals really aren't allowed under our current um, uh, statutes here in the city, oh, but, but I think there are 300 listings on Airbnb <laughs> for means. places in Edina. So, uh, Member Neal, I'd invite you to start us in a conversation about that. Well, um, this issue has come up uh, in a couple of in a couple of occasions, and we have addressed it on a complaint uh, basis. But uh, we are uh, trying to get our hands around the scope of how many. Uh, how many uh, particular units are available for rent uh, here in town. Um, so we are doing some research on that. But uh, I would ask uh, uh, Mr. Teague to speak to this a little bit right now because you don't have to do anything else to make it um, not allowed under our ordinance because it is not allowed under our ordinance right now. Mr. Teague. That is true. It is not allowed. Um, <clears throat> transient occupancy is not allowed in the city. And as Manager Neal mentioned, we've had a number of complaints. Um, we have, um, and that have been substantiated through just checking on the Airbnb website, where they have stopped the operation. Some, it has not been quite as easy, uh, but we'll continue to, to do so on a complaint basis. But the number that's potentially out there is quite alarming. So our, our plan was once we had once we had a, a more definite report for you on this, we will bring this back to the council and, and really seek your thoughts on it. Is this something you want to keep keep it uh, not allowed in, in our city, or do you want to open it up a little bit 
uh, before you answer that question, we want to be able to give you a, a, a sense of what it would mean in town. Okay. Just on that, on that point, one thing I would say is it, to the extent you can get any sense of whether this is a one-time big episode oh, no. as opposed to a, to a regular kind of thing, I'd be interested in that. Anything further? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just finish my comments sure. by reminding people that every Thursday we have a farmer's market at Centennial Lakes uh, in the afternoons. And uh, and I think they still have the movies uh, at the pavilion there that yeah, in, in, in the evening. So uh, get out and enjoy those things. As a uh, segue off member, Stuart, uh, just remind folks that there will be another community conversation about um, whether we should study uh, passenger rail in Edina on the 7th of September. Uh, Transportation Commission hosting that. I'm not sure if that'll be back at Public Works. Uh, Manager Neil, any mm. knowledge on that? Is where that meeting will be held? I don't know if we've got a set. I don't know if we've got a location set. Yet. Okay. Is it? Okay. Back at Public Works? Okay. I think we ought to discuss a little bit uh, beforehand the formatting of it and how to kick it off uh, because there was a little bit of um, I think dissatisfaction and confusion as to uh, what, what folks were supposed to do to participate in that first meeting that we had. They, they were directed, uh, I mean, they thought they were getting different messages at different board locations and they, they were just uncertain what to do and how to get their voice heard. Uh, although I think there were a lot of uh, you know places where they could post up notes about the gag rule and other things as well. But uh, I think we should have a, a better start to the meeting next time. Uh, on the 20th of, uh, what was that? Community Works, July 20th, wasn't it? We went, Mary? Southwest Community Works? Oh, uh, yes. We had um, a session on housing all along mm -hmm. the corridor, including some good information from Edina and the efforts we've made so far on, on affordable housing. Um, and then that night I had walk with the mayor over at Bredesen Park, he had one of our residents show up, plus my wife, so we had a a trio that walked at Bredesen Park as far as we could go uh, with the construction on the uh, on the uh, bikeway. Uh, you know, they've got part of it blocked off. So that was interesting. And then ran into a few other people who wanted to visit with the mayor but didn't want to walk with the mayor. <laughs> so they had these uh, little stop uh, stop and go conversations, which was good too. And got to pet some dogs. And, with the mayor. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> then on the... Uh, 25th, uh, I had a meeting with uh, ULI and uh, some other people in town um, about this continuing uh, conversation the mayors are having about the urban-rural divide. And I know that Member Staunton, I mentioned this, is working on this as well uh, with the League of Minnesota Cities. And Member Stewart, with his work at the Metro Cities, may be seeing some of this issue as well. I think we're uh, we're in the preliminary planning stages for trying to get up to a meeting uh, of mayors uh, in northwest Minnesota, uh, having Bemidji uh, play the host city and, and see if we can get ma uh, mayors within a 100 mile radius of Bemidji interested in coming and visiting with some urban mayors and just understanding some of the issues that we face together. Yeah, one, one of the things we heard at the legislative update was that the uh, uh, legislators were trying to find ways for the city, the, the representatives from the cities to get out and visit other yeah. communities and build more uh, communications bridges across those divides. Yeah, I think developing those yeah. personal relationships yeah. is important, as we all know. So we want to address some of those issues. So I'll keep you posted on that. Also stopped in at the senior center that afternoon. They were doing something called Buddy Bingo. And it was uh, grandparents and grandkids, not necessarily related to each other, and they were just having a terrific time. Heather Adelson and some others were running this program, and I don't know if it's something they're going to plan on repeating, but it looked like a roaring success to me. Mm. And um, uh, Member Stewart, thanks for noting the uh, Beacon Interfaith ribbon cutting tomorrow. I think they're probably fully occupied by now, and they want to show off a, a wonderful facility that they have in our community. Um, when you mentioned Airbnb, it made me think about a call I got and a conversation I've had by email with uh, Director Cotri about food trucks. And uh, I had an inquiry from uh, one of the neighbors down in the uh, Pamela Park neighborhood and wondering why there were food trucks over at Pamela Park 
uh, when uh, we had um, brick and mortar facilities just a short distance away at Valley View and Wooddale. Uh, and these folks were down there selling uh, food and uh, ice cream. So we got the ice cream shop a few blocks away, uh, Town Hall Tavern and uh, Snuffy's a few, another block away. And it turns out that the associations, the athletic associations are bringing in these food trucks. And, uh, and uh, I don't know if they're splitting revenue with the food truck operators or what, mm -hmm. uh, but they're there quite frequently. And I think Director Cotri is looking for some direction from this council as to what our thoughts are about whether it's appropriate for the athletic associations to be bringing in food trucks to some of our fields and uh, having those folks, uh, at least theoretically, uh, uh, deprive uh, neighboring or nearby uh, retailers or uh, food purveyors of, of revenue that they might otherwise get from having people wander over for an ice cream after a game or to get a hamburger or some other beverage. Manager Neal. Yeah, yes, uh, Your Honor, and I think, um, we're trying to get a sense of the scope of that issue as well. And uh, it, the question is, um, it's allowed under our ordinance in certain places in the community. Uh, this happens to be public property and do we want to have, a, uh, do we want to have a role in saying yes or no or have a permit that we grant yes or no? But before we have a conversation about it, we'd like to fully investigate how much of it is going on in the community. And, and much like the Airbnb, bring that back to you when we've got when we've got some more context for you to think about. Good. That's I'm glad you're on top of that. Thank you. Um, and then night to unite, we had a, a great night last night. Uh, lieutenants over here and Lieutenant Tholen and Tony Martin from Dispatch. Uh, my wife and I uh, were at five locations. Um, Two of the apartment complexes over off Vernon had some great conversations over there. Uh, I think they really appreciated seeing Lieutenant Tholen and, and Tony Martin over there and, and uh, uh, some terrific people over there as well, as I mentioned earlier. And then we were on to 49th Street and then down to St. Peter's Lutheran in that neighborhood, uh, back over to Arden Park. And uh, it was a terrific night. And then back to my own neighborhood for uh, kind of the wrap up on the evening. So. Uh, it's getting to be a better and better event, and people are really enjoying visiting with each other, and I think particularly enjoying interacting with the police department. So it's a, it's a great outing. We're going to try to keep our team together for next year, I think. And my, my wife feeding all of us uh, little brownies that she made as we drove along. So um, I think that's it for me. Manager Neal. Yeah. I just want to follow up on one thing that uh, Council Member Staunton mentioned, and it was from our community comment earlier. Um, it felt awkward to me that you know people came up and and put the issues out on the table, and we don't you know it kind of felt like we just moved on to the next thing. And I wonder if how that what does it look like behind the curtain? So the two in particular. So I think we just addressed the one about um, the school district. But there was also the Ms. Weaver on the secondhand smoke issue, and then we've got. But the mayor said we would refer that to the health commission, and so then look that for just advice. happens. And I mean, I heard you say it, but I didn't know how clear that was. Yeah, and so, is there is there any sort of follow up that happens to those folks um, from staff or anything, or is it just sort of I don't know, it'd be invisible. It's. When we get a reference, when the council references something back to a border commission, uh, we typically bring it back to the border commission. We say what the genesis of the topic was, that the council referred it back to the border commission. If, if there is uh, a sense from the border commission after they've had some discussion about it that it reaches a certain magnitude and there's some gray in this area, they may have to have, they may come back to the council and ask for, uh, for you to amend their current work plan to ask them to spend more time on that. that cause, because it may mean that they have to defer their, uh, their time and attention on something you previously asked them to right. do. So that, that's what happens next. And we pass that on to the staff that, uh, staff are interested of course in what happens at the council meeting. And, and uh, Jeff Brown in this case will, uh, is pretty faithful about uh, taking those matters back to that commission. I just didn't know how visible it is to that individual that comes and makes that comment and then it goes into the process and and they just 
I don't know, do they know that anything's happening or that there's any discussion or? They, they will because this person uh, sent us, we have her name and her, because she had a con we had a contact right. with her prior to the meeting, right? I would only suggest on that particular issue that we also, at least I've gotten a couple emails about uh, backyard um, fire pits and everything, yeah. which is a similar kind of secondhand smoke issue. And if we're sending this one to the to the health commission, that might be kind of a, a dual track thing. Just, you know, is there anything we need to be doing on that? We've looked so at that issue have, in the past yeah. okay. and um, deferred on it, but we, it All right. may well, be an fine. issue whose time has come again. I don't know. I'm just, I wasn't aware that you had uh, dealt with it in the past. So. Yeah. And I, and I think on that particular one, the, the politics of it are, are tricky. And so we have had that discussion here and decided not to ask the health commission to do anything with it because it just we we got mm -hmm. some we got some equal and, not, and well a lot more feedback that they didn't want us to do anything with it. They've okay. got to have a permit. They've got to get a permit from us, and uh, we've asked folks to think about being a good neighbor. But nonetheless, some folks are highly sensitive to the smoke in, oh, for sure. in the air. So. All right. Well, thanks. I yeah. just wanted to follow up on that. And then I think the the particularly sensitive one. Uh, was well for us uh, the school district you know and yep. mark cook's re request that uh, if they're not doing what they promised to do we should consider revoking the cup and that's i think we're a ways from that but in, in terms of the things that he talked about uh, i have a distinct recollection that uh, they were to provide that protective landscaping the lighting continues to be an issue it sounds like and then uh, his neighbor reinforced the drainage issue that some of them are facing now that they never faced before. And so I think we've got some investigating to do over there. And we do. And we Director have Dr. Milner has been on this before, I think. And we have a process to we'll investigate. We have a document that has conditions that we will hold them to. And we have a process for investigating. So we will do that. Okay. Uh, anything else, Manager Neal? Just two things very quickly. Uh, one, uh, a new law has gone into effect, went into effect today regarding uh, our new burden to notify people of new ordinances. So when we have, when we adopt a new ordinance, um, we are obliged to make sure the community knows that a new ordinance has been adopted and uh, in particularly people that are connected to us through our uh, electronic notification system, our city extra system. So there may be times when we have to advise you uh, th that the, the uh, publication date or the effective date for an ordinance may need to be pushed into the future a little ways to meet this new uh, requirement, but uh, we think it won't be too much fuss or muss. Uh, and finally, um, we launch a new city website tomorrow at 9 a.m. and uh, it's, it has been a, a great deal of, of work for our communications staff, Ms. Benarat in particular, um, but tomorrow morning is the big day. Director Benarat, you're staying in town tonight or <laughs> taking the risk of going home? <laughs> All right, thanks, Manager Neal. Uh, that prompt anything else from council members, otherwise we'll adjourn and then reconvene under the HRA. All right. We stand adjourned as the city council. Uh, calling to order the meeting of the uh, Housing Redevelopment Authority for the City of Edina, Wednesday, August 2nd. And um, Ms. Tim, roll call, please. Commissioner Brendel? Here. Commissioner Fisher? Here. Commissioner Staunton? Here. Commissioner Stewart? Here. Chair? Chair Hovland? Okay, Chair is here too. Uh, we've got a form of meeting agenda in front of us this evening. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda as shown? So moved. Second. A motion second to adopt the meeting agenda as shown for the HRA discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, community comment. Anyone here for community comment on the HRA? All right. Uh, consent agenda. We've got a, uh, what do we have on the consent agenda here? A couple the, of items. The minutes, appointment. Uh, minutes and the appointment to the uh, Dana Foundation, Foundation Board of Directors. You want to handle that by consent? Or did you want to comment, Manager Neal, on the No, it's on letter? consent, if the okay. council wants to take it All off. All right. 
Anyone want to take either of the proposed uh, consent uh, agenda items off consent? Otherwise, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the consent agenda as shown. So, so moved. moved. And a motion and a second to adopt the items on the consent agenda. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Close say nay. Carried. Uh, anything else for the HRA? Nothing else from staff. All right, good. All right, HRA stands adjourned.